Again, welcome, welcome to the fifth IMAS Illinois Symposium. The University of Illinois system welcomes participants from our three universities, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, University of Illinois Chicago, and University of Illinois Springfield. We also have the participation of Northern Illinois University, the Maris High School, Morton College, Chicago State University, City Colleges of Chicago, Malcolm X College, University of Wisconsin, University of Tennessee, Arizona State University, Technologic of Monterrey, Mexico, UNAM, National University of Mexico, Chicago, Ciatec, Mexico, Universities in El Salvador, Central America. Welcome, dear colleagues and friends from different institutions. My name is Elvira de Mejia. I'm a professor in food science and human nutrition, the director of the Division of Nutritional Sciences. And the reason why I'm here is because I'm the coordinator of IMAS, the Illinois Mexican and Mexican American Student Initiative at the University of Illinois system. IMAS represents a culture of support. It represents building pipelines for Mexican and Mexican American students, smoothing the path and retaining as many talented students as possible, building a network of collaborators. IMAS is about partnering in collaboration with our peers in Illinois and in Mexico. IMAS will enhance ongoing efforts by the system's three universities in Chicago, Urbana-Champaign, and Springfield. And to increase Mexican and Mexican-American recruitment and expand their educational opportunities. Today, it marks the establishment of the University of Illinois System Mexican and Mexican-American Students IMAS initiative on creating a sense of university belonging for Latino and Latina students. Please take a look at the agenda posted in the chat. After the official welcome remarks from the Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity and Engagement, University of Illinois, Chicago, Dr. Amalia Payares, we will have the first keynote speaker and the organizer of this symposium, Dr. Nidia Ruedas Gracia, Assistant Professor in the Department of Educational Psychology University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Then there will be the opportunity to select among three breakout rooms with presentations and activities. You can select based on your interest in, for instance, illuminating contemporary sense of belonging research, that's room number one, or focusing attention on sense of university belonging among Latino and Latina students, room number two, and finally, creating sustainable solutions to foster a sense of belonging. That's room number three. Then we will return to the main room for four powerful presentations and take home messages from our distinguished university leaders. Finally, we will summarize the conclusions, action plan activities, and next steps. Please write your questions in the chat and we will make sure to request the speakers to answer your questions. The symposium will be recorded and posted in our IMAS website. So you will be able to go back and look at it again. I thank the University of Illinois President, Dr. Tim Khalid and his team for their support, leadership, and enthusiasm in recognizing the need and opportunity IMAS represents. My gratitude to the speakers, my gratitude to the moderators summarizing and presenting conclusions from the breakout rooms and all the participants, one close to 180 participants this morning. A special recognition to Dr. Nidia Ruedas Gracia for her enthusiasm in developing the ideas and concepts to put together this symposium. I also want to thank Marisol Jimenez, her student, for all what she's doing towards this symposium. I hope this symposium will spark 
new collaborations, new research, new actions, and then many problems will be solved. Feel free to complete the survey, maybe during the break or during this um, event. Let's get started. We have here Dr. Amalia Payares, Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity and Engagement. She's a professor of political sciences and Latin American and Latino studies with well, her, her welcome remarks. Thank you, Dr. Payares, Vice Chancellor, please. Thank you, Dr. De Mejia, and welcome everybody. Um, I'm so honored and excited to be here um, and to it just welcome everybody to such an important topic that I wanna just talk a little bit about from my perspective as, as somebody who's been a faculty member and an administrator at UIC for about 27 years. And um, and I wanted to just share that I was, as I was thinking about this topic today, I was thinking about three things. I was thinking about spaces, I was thinking about resources and I was thinking about networks and how important they are, they are and continue to be. And what do I mean by spaces? And now I'm going to go back in history over, you know, I guess 45 years ago when Latino students organized in University of Illinois, Chicago, out of that organizing, out of those campaigns came three units that are still with us today. The Latin American Latino Studies Program, um, so an ethnic studies and Latin American studies program that exists to this day and is very vibrant and vital and has a curriculum that did not exist, uh, that was relevant to the communities and histories of La Latino students. Um, second, the LARES, which works uh, is, is a Latino you know, recruitment program and supports uh, students, advises and supports Latino students on our campus. And finally, the Latino Cultural Center. And all three of them have become so important uh, for helping to build a sense of belonging for Latino students at UIC. Um, I can't speak enough about all three of them uh, having, and I am a member of Latin, Latin American Latin, Latino Studies Program, but just for you to have a sense of the Latino Cultural Center, you know, um, the, you know, they, they launched a heritage garden program that really, we have a lot of Latino students involved in that. They do urban gardening. They understand that the, the relationship between gardening and social justice and uh, ethnic identity um, and so forth. So I, so I think these spaces were then generative of many new programs um, that were developed later, both programs that they did, as well as programs like a STEM program called Las Ganas for Latinos in STEM and other programs we have today are, are in place in, in, in part because of the collaborations that have existed between these three entities and, uh, and faculty. So space. The second thing is resources. What I mentioned, all this takes resources. The, the new program, newer program I talked about, Las Ganas, takes resources. And there are resources that are particular to the experience of Latino students that have have got involved great struggle. And I can speak from experience of a five year struggle in the state of Illinois to get the RISE bill passed because several educators and students, including UIC, who was really a, you know, a leader in this struggle, were involved in making sure that undocumented students could get, could get access to state resources and institutional resources from public universities. Without those resources, there are many students who would not have had access to uh, education um, and so the dream of the people who, who we were, when we were involved in that campaign was that students, the students of tomorrow would not even remember a time, would not even know there was a time when undocumented students did not have access to these resources. So resources continue to be issues. There are continue to be struggles around undocumented students and Latino students, and also pro, uh, resources for programs that are gonna help Latino students not only feel like they belong, but that feeling of belonging will help them succeed in um, their efforts at the, at the university and professional level. And finally, networks. Networks are so important. Networks with community, because not everything happens at the university, but when Latino students understand that their university is connected to their community, and that there can be internships, relationships, sponsorships, connections, resources that are shared, then they don't see that divide between the university and their community. They see a relationship. They don't have to choose one or the other. They don't have to feel bifurcated. They feel like they can actually come to the university and then prepare to, to work in their community or support their communities. That is something really important because a lot of students have told me that when they come to the university, if that doesn't exist or they don't see that in the classroom, they feel very disjointed. Um, and then the broader networks that we are building. Right now, the, the, the 20 HSIs that are R1s 
that include UIC as many as well as many universities in New Mexico, California, Texas. Um, hopefully in the future would we'll include Urbana because every year there's more of these universities um, are creating a network so we can then help more Latino students go to graduate school and become faculty themselves. Um, and so those networks are really important because we need to get to know each other and be able to support Latino students you know, nationwide to make sure that we are we are moving forward in education, that we not only see the students, not only see the university as a place where they belong, but the place that they can lead. Um, so I'll stop here. I'm super excited to learn more. Um, uh, and I thank you. Thank you again for uh, for this very important topic. Thanks, Elvira. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Payares. You are a role model and an example for many of us. So thank you for your leadership and support. Thank you. Very well. Now we'll move to our next uh, important keynote speaker, our uh, organizer, the professor who developed these ideas and concepts. And now we are here uh, with 180 registered people, 84 at the moment attending. So we have here Dr. Nidia Ruedas Gracia, assistant professor, Department of Educational Psychology, University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruedas Gracia, and the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Arvita. Okay, let me share my screen. Thank you all so much for, for coming, for hanging out this morning with us, uh, this lovely Thursday morning. Um, so I wanted to essentially kick off our symposium, and I know it's it's the keynote um, speaker, and I always think it's a grand thing, and I want to be influential and, and say powerful messages. But all I could think of as I was creating this was, how can I kind of lay the groundwork for the amazing speakers that are coming in the, the next few hours? And so um, this keynote will, will kind of touch on sense of belonging, sense of university belonging, how we think about it, um, and then also touch on, so, so what do we do? So why, what is it and, and why is it important? Why do we keep talking about it? All right, so first I'll start off with storytelling. So um, to orient you around who I am and the research that I do and, and why I'm talking to y'all for, for all of 30 minutes. Um, so my name is Nidia Ruedas Gracia. I'm right there in the middle um, eating a donut. I love snacking and you will often find a snack in my bag that I'll pop up and, and eat. Um, and then we'll start over here on the, I think it's your left. Uh, so I'm actually from Baldwin Park, California, which um, if you didn't know is the birthplace of In-N-Out. If you don't like In-N-Out, just don't tell me, so then I won't be sad. Uh, I know there's an In-N-Out Shake Shack uh, kind of rivalry, but I'm a fan of In-N-Out. It's, it's birthplace is where I was raised, so Baldwin Park, California in Los Angeles. Um, and then I put another picture uh, below that, which is like a blend of the Mexican flag and the American flag. So I identify as Mexican-American. Both of my parents are from Mexico, and then they immigrated to the United States, and then I was born and raised in, in Los Angeles, California. So I really identify with this blended culture, um, sort of speak, of being Mexican and American, and, and it's really colored my upbringing. I also put a, a small um, graphic there where it says FLIP National, and FLIP stands for First Gen Low Income Partnership. The reason why I put that there is because I also identify as first generation uh, uh, low income. So former first gen low income college student. And we actually have our own holiday. It was a couple of days ago. So happy first belated first gen day for those who identify as first gen in the room. But that also colors a lot of my experience of belonging in different spaces. Then if you jump off over, um, we have the UCLA Bruin. So for undergrad, I went to UCLA, which is an hour away from my house, from where I grew up, um, two hours with traffic. So if you know LA, you know you always have to give that disclaimer. Um, but it, it felt like miles and miles away. It felt like it was in another state because I had never really left home um, in that way before. So UCLA felt far, it wasn't quite that far, but I, 
uh, UCLA is also where I um, really came to grasp a deep understanding with what sense of belonging was before I even know that it had a name. So I really um, credit my UCLA experience for helping me develop what this concept meant to me, to others like me, and to people from different groups. I also put a photo of a volleyball net and a volleyball uh, because I, I played volleyball in high school, club volleyball, and then when I went to UCLA, I was so overwhelmed with all the newness and the cultural clashes and all the things that I, I didn't even touch it. I didn't even try uh, to play volleyball, which was so, so fun for me and so relaxing. But then once I went on to, so I, I graduated and then I went to get my master's and then I uh, went to get my PhD. And um, in my PhD program, I did feel a higher sense of belonging and I dabbled right back into volleyball. So I'll talk about that later. That's why I wanted to throw that graphic in there. And then up top, I have a picture of me and my mama. So that's kind of um, to give a sense about how I'm also very family oriented. So I have all of these different identities and I also highly prioritize family, um, highly prioritize being a sister, being a daughter, being a cousin, being a niece. Um, and so family is really important to me. And that also colored my educational experience moving moving along. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that as well. So that's a little bit about me. And you might be like, well, you know, why do I want to know all these all these facts about you? Well, I'll talk about them a little bit later. But those are my these are my my fun facts um, that I like telling people. And then I have my my research world. So in terms of research, um, I have two broad strands of work. The first one is very researchy in nature, where I explore sociocultural factors that impact academic performance and psychological well-being among culturally diverse students, including Latinx students. And then secondly, I like to use this first strand, very researchy strand, to actually inform and develop culturally sustaining interventions for minoritized students. Um, and so since I had a little bit of hand in organizing the symposium, I was a little biased in how, to, in how to organize it. So that's what you're essentially going to see here is that you're going to have guest speakers who are part of the first strand and they're doing amazing work at exploring how sociocultural factors like sense of belonging impact the experience of Latinx students um, and different types of Latinx students. So you'll get to pick some breakout rooms um, uh, with those types of guest speakers to, to for you to get a little bit more familiarity about the research around that. Uh, and then in the latter half, we're actually going to have guest speakers and other keynote speakers who are actually on the ground. Uh, research is very important, but you, we also need those people on the ground doing applied work, developing these programs, policies, practices for Latinx students. So those are my two big strands. And I and I kind of, you know, it was my framework as as we developed this symposium. So so hopefully you enjoy and you find some very cool guest speakers um, that you will uh, engage with and learn from today. All right, so sense of belonging. Um, back to back to my UCLA experience. Again, I'm from Los Angeles and I went to UCLA um, in case you didn't catch that. So sometimes college was cool. Um, I found a great group of friends. So right off the bat from my first year, I joined a Latina sorority, Phi Lambda Rho sorority. And I really found a sense of belonging to that space. Uh, and it really helped sustain me uh, in college because even though college was confusing i had these people who looked like me in terms of race in terms of gender they understood my background culture so a lot of things i didn't have to explain they just kind of got it um, and i could study with them and i could take classes with them and um, they were just very much a, a social support system and then at the beginning there i was i was fumbling around i didn't know what a major was I didn't know how to take classes. Um, and then they said, you have to pick a major. And I just didn't know what was going on. So I, I was kind of sad. But then once I figured out my major, that was very interesting. Then I started to feel better about my place uh, in the university. So I, I found psychology 
and, and I was very intrigued by the concept and by the research being done. And so uh, at that point, I was like, okay, college is cool. I can do this. I, I, I know what to do. But it wasn't all great. It wasn't all rosy. Um, sometimes college was not so cool. And I felt lonely. Uh, I felt not cared for, or I felt like my cultural background was misunderstood. Um, so even though I loved my major and I loved the research that was going on in it, I didn't really have a lot of friends in my classes because the major, at least at um, UCLA, didn't have too much Latinx representation. So in terms of faculty or in terms of students. So I would go into these classrooms and nobody looked like me. Nobody really understood the way I, that I thought about things. Um, and I had to explain a lot of things. Um, and so I wasn't really making a lot of friends in the classroom, wasn't feeling a strong sense of belonging there. Um, and also, like I said before, during my introduction, I'm very family oriented. So if my family needed me, if my mom or my brother needed me, then I was I was gone. I was off to, to, to back home um, to help my family and support in any way I could. And so part of my student ident identity included um, my family identity and, and prioritizing my family. And so sometimes when I needed an extension or when I needed extra support um, or I, I needed some type of help or resources, my professors didn't really understand those family responsibilities and the importance of, of going back home and needing to be a part of the family unit as well as being a student. So in those cases, there seemed to be a big cultural mismatch and, and I felt lonely and I felt like nobody really understood what my type of college experience was like. But I didn't know that this term sense of belonging existed. Um, so for many of those four years, I thought it was me. I thought it was me. I thought, you know, I'm, if you haven't noticed already, also, if you know me, I'm per, I'm pretty extroverted. Um, but in that moment, I said, maybe I'm doing something wrong. Maybe I'm not working hard enough to, to make friends. Um, maybe I'm just too different than the faculty and the students and they'll never understand me. Maybe it's me. Um, so for a long time, that's what I was thinking. Um, and then I started delving into the research, delving into articles, taking different types of classes, talking to my uh, peers and my classmates. And I realized maybe it's me, maybe it's not Maybelline, maybe it's sense of belonging. So I wanted to take a, uh, a moment here to talk about the definition of sense of belonging, specifically sense of university belonging. All right, so sense of university belonging is students' perceived social support on campus, a feeling or sensation of connectedness, the experience of mattering or feeling cared about, accepted, respected, valued by, and important to the group, which could be the campus community, or others on campus, which could be faculty or peers. And importantly, I, I, I italicized some of these terms because I feel like um, when we're talking about sense of belonging, <clears throat> it's a little bit um, of a smooth conversation because whenever I go and I tell someone, hey, I'm Nydia and I study sense of belonging, they're like, cool, I know what that means. I know what sense of belonging means. I've had moments when I've felt a sense of belonging or when I haven't felt a sense of belonging. And so we kind of gloss over the definition because everybody's had that experience. Um, but because we gloss over the definition, sometimes we lose track of what that actually means. What does it actually mean to feel a sense of belonging? And especially when it comes to the university. So I italicized, for example, social support. So the idea that a student needs to feel supported on campus, whether that be by the community as a whole um, or by others on campus. So like it could be individual level, like faculty or peers or staff. They need to feel this idea of connectedness or match between them, their cultural background and the, the institution. They also need to feel like they matter, that they're, um, that they're cared about, that they're accepted, 
respected, valued, and important to the group. So a lot of times, you know, if we're kind of wrapping our heads around how can we support or foster a sense of university belonging, I always tell people, let's go back to the definition. Let's go back to those italicized things. Are you promoting or fostering an environment where the student of interest that you're interested in, this case, Latinx students, feels accepted, respected, valued, connected, important? Those are kind of some key terms that I think are very important. Um, and so we can think about times in my undergrad where I did feel that social support via my sorority, or I did feel accepted and respected via my peers. Um, but we can also think about ways where I didn't feel connected um, or valued um, by, say, professors or peers uh, when they didn't quite understand my background. So these are all very important words to hold on to as we think about sense of belonging. Now, let's kind of narrow it down into the Latinx college student experience. I put the, I like, I was real petty about it. I didn't put, I put it in quotation marks and I didn't capitalize the T. Um, and the reason why I wanted to do that is because I don't believe that there is one Latinx college student experience. And the reason why is because we, each of us possess many different social identities. And we live in a world where um, um, society places value on these different social identities. So we are not just, I am not just Mexican American. I'm also a female. I'm also from a low income background. Um, and so there are a lot of different social identities that we all encompass. And so even within the Latinx group, you have different ethnicities, but you also have different social identities. And, and we really, in order to fully understand the Latinx college student experience, we need to realize that everybody, every individual who identifies as Latinx also identifies as different other things. And so they're really um, Roman, Roman college um, in various different ways, depending on how all these social identities are mixing. So um, my wonderful grad student and I created, he's really the creative brains here, uh, created this, this Venn diagram that we're saying is a flower. So imagine that this is a flower and each of those oval thingies are um, petals. And each of those petals are a social identity. So we just highlighted three of them so you could get a sense of what we're talking about uh, when we think about social identities. So one petal could be R, race. Another petal we call G for gender identity. And then there's another petal, S, socioeconomic status. And then we have a lot of other different petals because we have a lot of different social identities. And the reason why we did it as a Venn diagram is because you can think about how some research or, or some policies and practices really target one petal of a person. So there might be cultural centers that focus on the R, um, or there might be policies that focus on the S, socioeconomic status. And so they focus on one petal of this flower. Um, but then to really get a better understanding and really find the best support for students, it's important to realize that these petals are also overlapping. So for example, you can think about race and gender overlapping. You can think about gender and socioeconomic status um, overlapping. And at the base, um, which we think is really the, the base of what we want to know about the full holistic experience is all of these social identities um, coming together. And, and if you see, they're not coming together at the end, they're coming together at the base because really we're starting off in an intersectional identity. So we wanna think about how we, we wanna think about the Latinx student experience as not only colored by our racial and ethnic background, but also by various different social identities. Um, and I wanted to highlight this because I feel like our guest speakers are gonna do an excellent job at describing different petals and how they overlap with each other 
um, the, the race pedal will obviously be there, but we're also going to bring in other concepts such as immigration status and gender and um, developmental period. So I'm really excited for, for y'all to learn about that. So now that we understand, well, there are different social identities, there are different ways to think about sense of belonging, we have a, a little bit of a better grasp on these highlighted terms that can help us create policies and programs. And I wanted to add in just a little, a little extra um, as we think about how we can foster sense of belonging among Latinx um, college students. Remember, or if you didn't know, well, I'm here to tell you, sense of belonging is context dependent. What that means is that you can have a sense of belonging to different contexts, different places, different spaces, and different identities. So within the umbrella of college, you can have a sense of belonging to different contexts within the college. Book clubs, you can have a sense of belonging to Greek life like I did. You can have a sense of belonging to your classroom, like I did not. Um, you can have a sense of belonging to research. Um, so for example, I was um, admitted to the Ronald E. McNair program, which um, U of I has a McNair program. I am now a proud mentor. I was waiting since I got here to be a mentor. Um, but once I was accepted into that program, which is its goal is to diversify the professoriate and and expose undergrads to research um, in case they want to go that route, which I did. <laughs> um, once I got accepted there, then I felt a stronger sense of belonging to the university via this research program because I felt really connected to the other uh, students of color that were in my cohort. You can also have a sense of belonging to your organizations and clubs, to community service programs, and ultimately you can also create your own space within the university. So this might feel a little overwhelming, like, oh, okay, so it's not even just about university belonging, but now there's all these other things that we have to um, foster a sense of belonging to. Um, but the way I see it is that these are more opportunities to create that sense of belonging. You don't have to feel a strong sense of belonging to all of these contexts, and it might feel overwhelming or impossible to feel a strong sense of belonging to all of these. But if you can have a, a healthy sense of belonging to some of these spaces or most of these spaces, then you have a, a stronger chance of feeling that match between the university and, and your upbringing and your culture and your value system. So what do we do? Again, part of these keynotes and guest speakers are actually gonna show you what they are doing out in the field. So we have all this research, what are we doing out in the field? So you'll, you'll get that from the symposium, but we also have a, an activity that we'll be doing for about an hour. And so I really wanted to prime um, that activity as well. So as you listen to the guest speakers and the keynotes, think about the definition again of sense of belonging. Um, if you are a student, how can we show that we value you as a student? How do we show that we care for you, that we respect you? How do we show that, that you matter to the university, that you're important to the university? How do we do that? So when you're thinking about actual action plans, um, and if you're getting a little bit overwhelmed or confused or wanting some di direction, go back to the definition. See if those italicized words can help you develop some kind of plan. Um, and then secondly, remember that sense of belonging is context dependent. So now we have a variety of different contexts that we can foster a sense of belonging to. There are a variety of different contexts within the university. So we have a lot of opportunities that we can actually utilize to foster a sense of belonging. So we're no longer, no longer here in the symposium um, constricted to just university belonging, but now we know there are so many contexts within the university that we can um, and try for and um, really foster. I'm gonna check my time because I can talk. So let me see what time it is. All right, cool, all right. <laughs> um, so I wanted to leave just a, a few moments for if anybody had any questions while I'm here. So the other thing that you could do is that we can keep chatting. So if this sounds interesting to you, if you'd like to delve into 
either the research of this or the applied component of this, of the what do we do, I'm, I'm extremely happy to, to talk to you about it. Send me an email um, and we can meet and we can keep discussing how we do this for various different populations, but especially for Latinx students, incorporating their different social identities, um, realizing that there are different contexts that we can, we, where we can utilize a sense of belonging. So I feel really hopeful about the direction of the research, but also the direction of belonging programs and interventions. And I'm, I'm happy to discuss it. So my website is there. My Twitter handle is there. Sometimes I say fun things or I'll retweet <laughs> something that's funny. Um, and also my email address. So just feel free to email me if you'd like to contact me. So thank you for, so much for, for taking a listen. And um, I'll open it up just a few minutes for some questions in case anybody has any. We have a, a hand raised. Okay. How do you pronounce your name? Hinda? You're muted. <clears throat> Can Hinda unmute? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Eric, can, can you unmute Dr. Hinda say? Thank yes, you. I'm unmuted now. Oh, there you go. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation and for this wonderful opportunity for us to come together as a campus to address this topic. I, I'm on a committee at UIS that's looking at um creating a plan for recruitment and retention of underrepresented minority students uh of which the largest are latinx students my impression of the the plan and the focus of the committee um is that people are focusing for instance on uh things like is there a class that is a gateway class that a lot of students are struggling with? And what can we do about that class? Um, I'm seeing very, very little discussion of cultural issues um, or specific issues that might be relevant to Latinx students that might be different from, for instance, rural white students, which is another group that we're looking at. Although we, at UIS, we do extremely well with recruitment and retention of rural white students. So I guess a question I have for you is how important is it to look at a sense of belonging within the Latinx student context in terms of recruitment or retention, or is that or, or should we be focusing on, you know, are people struggling with passing algebra? Yeah, great question. Um, I have so much, so much to say. I'll try to keep it, um, keep it streamlined. Um, one thing that's just coming up in my mind, and there's plenty of literature, I can send lots of citations is um, college choice is important, and it's not just based on how, you know, whether the college is top ranked or whether it's affordable. People also need to feel a sense of belonging, prospective belonging to that college or university. Um, so, yes, we can offer, um, you know, classes and re remedial, you know, quote unquote remedial classes or or financial resources and all that. And that can be a signal of belonging in the sense that, hey, we see you, we want you to come here, here are these support systems. Um, but there are also other signals that are non-cognitive in, in many ways and, and uh, not in that kind of category and are more psychological in nature um, in that, that are really important. And a lot of the guest speakers today will, will talk to that as well. Um, so not only is, is college choice um, is, is college choice psychological in nature, which includes needing to feel a sense of belonging to that new space, um, but also, um, 
how can I, so college choice is important. Um, but I also wanted to, so I, I don't know if any of y'all have been in this situation, but there are, that are, there are spaces that I have no business being in. Like I am not good at bowling at all, but here I was in a bowling league. Um, and it, it, it wasn't that I was good at bowling. It wasn't that I was a, a star, but I felt such a strong sense of belonging to that group that it kept me in even when there were so many barriers and I was not getting points and all of that kind of thing. So we can imagine if you foster a strong enough sense of belonging, it can really strengthen a student's ability to engage and be retained in a space because maybe the first year they don't do too well, but but they they can grow and they can find their resources and they can get past that hump and eventually graduate. So it's also important to think about if we're fostering a space where they really feel like, hey, I can mess up, but they're not going to kick me out. I still have opportunities and resources and people here that have my back and want me to succeed. That can do wonders, wonders for, for people. So um I'd recommend sticking around for the symposium, but also I, you know, I'm happy to talk about about fostering that sense of belonging at, at UIS. Quick one um, that was sent in a direct message. The question is, would you have any thoughts on how to increase sense of belonging between Latinx graduate students and Latinx faculty while being cognizant of the extra mentorship duties that faculty of color tend to have? Um, I think it's really important to think of also structural ways that Latinx uh, graduate students and faculty can, um, uh, where they can be supported. So for example, making some of these this invisible work visible and part of the tenure process can really assist Latinx faculty in being retained, staying at these institutions, but feeling supported that they can do these things that they're so used to doing, like mentoring and service, and it can count toward their success in their career. So um, I think a lot of these things where we're talking about grad students and faculty are a structural change that can happen. And so we have lots of people in this room that are at various different levels of the hierarchy that can really help with that. But um, that's just one, one quick one, but I'm happy to talk about other ways as well. <laughs> All right, so I'll get us going. Uh, what we're gonna do next is that we're going to have video introductions of our guest speakers so you can um, know a little bit about what they'll be talking about in the breakout rooms, and then you can choose which breakout room you wanna go to based on that. Um, and also just a note about the activity that's happening at, happening at 1045, there will be two breakout rooms for that, not three. So breakout room three, um, if, if you go to breakout room three, we'll just redirect you to breakout room one or two. And then don't forget to take the survey as well, um, if you can, throughout the symposium. So I'll put the link in the chat, and that way you can just click on it and take it as you can. And we just want to learn more about your sense of belonging experience. Hi, I'm Sue Ferugia, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Assessment and Planning at UIC Student Affairs. I'm trained as a developmental psychologist and my scholarship focuses on student success, engagement, and student learning. I invite you to listen to my talk on UIC students' sense of belonging. During this presentation, you will learn about research my colleagues and I have conducted on belonging at UIC and a number of initiatives that are informed by this work. Hello, my name is Nicole Perez and I'm a bridge to the faculty scholar at the UIC College of Medicine. My area of expertise is medical education, and sociology of race, ethnicity, and immigration. I invite you to listen to my talk entitled, Promoting a Sense of Belonging Among Latinx Faculty and Staff in STEM, with the objective of centering the perspectives of faculty and staff that are promoting opportunities for Latinx students to pursue STEM majors. Hello, my name is Mary Duenas, and I work at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, as an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies. My area of expertise is examining Latinx at all college students' experiences and creates pathways to help them thrive and succeed in higher education. I implement research to inform practice using both qualitative and quantitative methods. I invite you to my talk on the connection between sense of belonging and imposter syndrome, 
or Latinx uh, or college students. The objective of this talk is to talk about the relationship between sense of belonging and imposter syndrome and how it may manifest in group of Latinx students attending a four-year university. My hope is to bring light to these experiences and share ways uh, in which we can think about and consider change. I look forward to meeting you all. Thank you. Hi, my name is Antonio Duran. My pronouns are he, him, his, el, and I'm an assistant professor in the higher and post-secondary education program at Arizona State University, where my research focuses on how historical and contemporary legacies of oppression influence college student development, experiences, and success. In particular, I take an intersectional approach to understanding how those with multiply minoritized identities experience our collegiate environments. So for this particular talk, I'm gonna be focusing specifically on the experiences of those who identify as part of the queer and trans Latinx AO community and what higher education professionals and faculty can do to better serve these populations, keeping in mind how their identities intersect with one another. So it is my hope that you leave with tangible ideas and thoughts on how to implement this perspective. Hello everyone, my name is Osley J. Flores. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, my, my area of research focuses on two strands. One is I look at school leadership and focusing on equitable school leadership and how taking a, pushing for a more race conscious approach to leadership. A second strand of research based on my own experience in, as a doctoral student was looking at how graduate students of color persist and navigate us, particularly in, in predominantly white institutions during the doctoral journey. So that's what I'll be focusing on, on on my presentation. So the title of my presentation will be Compañerismo as a Sense of Belonging, Glad Latino Graduate Students Navigating Uncharted Waters. Um, the focus of uh, the topic will be how three Latino men uh, in, a, in a same doctoral program were able to build this cultural phenomenon of compañerismo, this relational bond to support their, their successful navigation and completion of the doctoral, journey, the doctoral program. So the learning objective is for you to learn more about this, this idea, this theory of compañerismo and how it's helped shape the, the sense of belonging within structures and spaces that are not um, built for them. And so how compañerismo can be used as not, not only as a strength, but how compañerismo bends spaces that creates a sense of belonging for, for participants. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bernie Santosero, and I'm a research professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences in the College of Pharmacy at the University of Illinois, Chicago. I call myself a structural biologist since I'm interested in biological molecules and their structures, ligands, amino acids, proteins, and protein complex at atomic resolution. And we can use that information to the development of new pharmaceutical drugs like antibiotics. I'm also involved in the Graduate College and the Office of Diversity in the development of new programs for underrepresented students and faculty. I'd like to invite you to listen to my talk entitled Promoting a Sense of Belonging, Latinx Students in STEM, which will describe some of the elements of our program called Las Ganas, Latinos Gaining Access to Networks for Advancement in Science. Thank you. Everyone, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Sue Ferugia. I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Assessment and Planning um, at UIC Student Affairs. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm going to just move some of these things around. Um, I was uh, trained as a developmental psychologist in the School of Sociology at the University of California, Irvine. And I have a master's in community clinical psychology from Cal State Northridge. So I think um, that training really plays out in a lot of the work um, that I do. 
uh, after I finished my doctoral degree, um, I um, had the extreme pleasure, we'll say, um, in living in New Zealand for six years. Um, I was faculty, um, tenured faculty at the University of Auckland. Um, it really is beautiful there and it, it truly is paradise, um, but it wasn't home. And so in uh, 2012, I came back home to Chicago and um, I started in at UIC. I currently serve as the Assistant Vice Chancellor, as I mentioned, in Student Affairs as of February 2020. Um, I'm going to be talking today about some of the work that I did um, during my time in undergraduate affairs. Um, uh, part of which was when I established the Office for Research on Student Success. I think Lindsay Back uh, is on this call and she is the current director, so that's exciting. Um, and she has, um, she transitioned in um, and I worked with her for a while and, and now she has, um, she is the director. So she can also, I'm sure, be able to um, share some things about some of the work um, that's happening and some of the initiatives that stemmed from this work. Um, okay, so just to kind of jump right in, um, I, I always like to contextualize and, and set the stage for the things I'm going to be talking about. Most people on the call probably know uh, about UIC, but I, I'd like to just share this to set the stage a little bit. Um, who are UIC students? We are a large public university um, in the heart of Chicago. Um, we have over 33,000 um, students, uh, over 21,000 undergraduate students, and a large number of graduate and professional students as well. Um, one of the things that you um, may know about UIC is that we are a Hispanic serving institution. Um, this is a somewhat recent designation and, and we see this with this chart um, and that we've had a really large increase in the number of Latinx students um, in the last 15 years or so. So in 2006, we were, uh, our undergraduate uh, first year students were 18% Latinx and now we have over 40% coming in, plus a large number of our transfer students are also Latinx students. Um, and so we've really had this kind of profound um, growth in the, um, both in kind of the raw numbers, um, the actual numbers, but also the proportion of students who identify as Latinx. Um, I think it's really important also um, to talk about student success um, and, and set the stage for this as well. Um, because during this time that we've had this really profound growth in both the number of students as a whole, the number of Latinx students, um, and the proportion of Latinx students, we've also had this really profound increase in the success of our students as measured by graduation. Um, so the uh, class that entered in in 1991 um, they were, the, the graduation rates were around 30% on average, a bit lower for Latinx students, and the class that entered in the university in uh, 2015, the graduation rate overall is um, about 60%. Um, we do have an equity gap that we really need to um, address. It is important to UIC and, and it is being worked on, but there's clearly still some work to do. Um, so one of the efforts um, and, and the foundation for the work I'm going to be talking about um, that really served to think about how we increase the success of students and we close equity gaps um, was a student success initiative that was launched in 2012. Um, and I share this because um, it really set the stage for why we started engaging as a university and doing this work around a, a sense of belonging. So there was a campus-wide student success initiative one of the recommendations that came out of that was to understand the role of non-cognitive strengths in student success um, and to, and to really um, understand that um, and, and belonging um, was really a critical piece of, um, of that. And so um, the research on non-cognitive strengths targeting, targeting first year students really led to a better understanding of their impact on academic performance and retention. And I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, so we were, a recommendation came out, we had a charge um, within the Office of Undergraduate Affairs to really understand non-cognitive strengths. We looked um, at research to see what was, you know, what people were saying, what was, was happening in this area. Um, ultimately, we uh, honed in on a framework that was developed by the Consortium on School Research at the University of Chicago. Um, we really liked this framework. It was, it was um, broad, it had flexibility, 
it allowed us to focus on factors that are amenable to change and relevant to college students. And that was a really important kind of underpinning for all of this. And when we think about why students are successful, um, it's, it was really important to focus in those things that we could actually do something about. You know, what, what, what are we, you know, it's, it, it may be interesting to know something, but if we can't do anything about it, um, it's, 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 not the, it's not the right work for us. Um, I also want to just highlight that um, this has been a very iterative process. Um, we started doing this work in 2013. Um, as new research came out, stakeholder meetings with people on campus, um, it's really led to change and evolve the work. Um, just very briefly to highlight the model that we used. Um, the, the model suggests that academic performance or student success um, really starts with kind of academic mindsets. And this is where we situate sense of belonging. Um, we see this as kind of a, a feeling, that feeling as um, was discussed earlier, um, that sense of connectedness. Um, and it's really part of that academic mindset. Um, those in turn are related to learning strategies in this proposed model, um, academic perseverance, uh, social skills, although there's less research for that, academic behaviors, um, and, and in turn, these turn uh, are associated with performance. We take into consideration student background characteristics, the sociocultural context, as well as school um, and classroom context. So this provided a really great framework for us to be thinking about the role of non-cognitive strengths and assets in student success. Um, so very briefly to, um, to tell you about um, the initial studies that we did in 2013, we uh, had students in the first year writing class complete a survey in 2014. Um, we went back, it was an expand, uh, expanded survey with more constructs. Uh, we also had a greater proportion of students complete it. So in, in that 2014 administration of the survey, 97% uh, of those in class participated, reflecting 91% of first-year students. Um, and so we were really excited um, because we felt like this was a really good assessment of um, first-year students and, and their experiences. Um, and it would, be, it would well represent um, that, that class of students. Um, and so going, oh, going back to that model, um, and, and I'm just going to highlight a couple of things in here. Um, so this is where we initially tested that, um, uh, that framework developed by the University of Chicago. Um, but we looked at academic mindsets. So we looked at perceived self-advocacy, their sense of belonging um, and academic motivation. And, and that's where this sense of belonging piece came in. And, and, the, and the, the short story of, of a somewhat complicated model is that these things really mattered um, for performance and, and for retention. Um, and so that we see that mindsets were in fact strongly associated with learning strategies, which in turn were associated with performance. We do see um, these independent um, effects of academic preparation. So how well prepared a student is for college and then also a student's background also had an additional um, effect. And that's where we looked at race ethnicity, we looked at uh, first generation college status, and we looked at um, uh, if they were Pell eligible or not. Um, and, and so what this really told us is that, you know, belonging really matters. We are able to, to demonstrate it, uh, but it didn't kind of get into the kind of the hows and the whys. And, and so we're interested in really digging into that further. So one of the studies that we did with these data was a, a, a deeper dive on mindsets to really understand how self-efficacy, academic motivation, and sense of belonging kind of cluster together. Um, and do they create different profiles of students? Um, so we used an analytic approach um, that's called profile analysis. And, and we look to see, are there kind of different patterns of, of how students respond to these three um, constructs? And if they do, do they differ in terms of student success? So we could find that there are different patterns. We would expect students who re respond um, you know, high on self-efficacy to also respond high in motivation and sense of belonging. We kind of see these things all working together. Um, but are there differences in the pattern? And if so, um, do they play out in and, and student success? And so we, we did see um, some differences. So we saw 
what we expected. We saw a group of students who were high in all of these, thing, these things. Um, again, we expect these things to kind of be similarly related. They're all part of this global construct over this global umbrella of academic mindsets. And so we expect students to, there would be a group of students who report high on all of these things. We also expect a group of students to report low on all of these things. That kind of theoretically makes sense. Um, but there are two groups of students that, that were kind of off that, that linear approach. Um, one of which was the high self-efficacy group. So they reported that they were high in self-efficacy. So they believed in their abilities to be successful but they didn't really feel so connected to campus and they were not necessarily, this is intrinsic motivation. They didn't have strong intrinsic motivation. And then there was another group of students that were the high belonging group. And this group of students, they felt really connected to campus. Um, so they felt like they belonged, um, but they really didn't believe in themselves. You know, their, their self-advocacy was low and, and their intrinsic motivation was low. Um, and so we did see some, some differing patterns, but again, it only matters um, if we see things that are different kind of in the, um, in the outcomes. And, and, and we did find um, what I think are some pretty interesting things. Um, the first of which, um, as, as kind of expected, the students who reported all high on, on all three measures um, did, did the best in terms of grades. Um, so we looked at their first term GPA, we looked at the, the number of credits that they earned in their first year of college. And students who reported high in all of these things had the highest grades um, and earned the most credits. We also looked at that self-efficacy group. They came in kind of second. So students who believed in their abilities to be successful um, did well. They didn't do quite as well, but they, they still did better than the other two groups, which were the all low and the belonging low uh, and the belonging high group. So that belonging high group who felt connected, but they really didn't necessarily um, believe in themselves. They weren't as intrinsically motivated to do well in school. Um, they did similar to the other. Um, but we saw a different pattern um, for retention. And, and this is, I think, when, we, when we're thinking about student success and, and when we have kind of opportunities to ensure that students are successful, retention is essential because if they're not still at the university, we've lost our opportunity to, to intervene. We've all lost our opportunity um, to ensure that, that, that they um, feel like they belong, to ensure that they, they ultimately graduate. Um, and, and what we saw is that the students who felt like they belonged, so they felt, and this is a global measure of connectedness, um, that when they felt like they belonged, they were just as likely to be retained as that all high group. So there was that, that, that kind of feeling of belonging um, feeling that they were connected to other people on campus that kept them in college um, in ways that the self-efficacy, their beliefs and their ability to be successful did not keep them in school. Um, so we had these kind of higher levels of, of retention for that belonging group. Um, and so we thought that was really kind of profound, um, you know, that when we're thinking about um, how do we improve the success of students, how do we remove barriers so that they, that our students can meet their potential and graduate from college? Um, this really highlights the, the, the clear role that, that belonging has um, in, in, our, in our work. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, based on some of this research, some of the um, work that was done to institutionalize some of the findings. Um, so in 2015, based on this work, um, an inventory was um, uh, put into our placement testing system. Um, the initial construct or the initial um, inventory that students complete um, just had these four initial constructs, um, but recognizing that sense of belonging um, was, was an incredibly important um, part of that when we are thinking about how we increase retention and graduation of our students. Um, that has since built out. Um, so this is the current inventory. Um, and, um, and at the time of placement testing, uh, students go in, they complete um, an inventory um, in which they answer um, an, a series of um, questions and statements um, around these different domains. 
Um, there are reports that are available online that talks about how um, the system was developed, what's being done. Um, and um, as I mentioned, um, Lindsay um, and, and her team have um, continued to um, uh, facilitate um, the, um, to facilitate that initiative. And I'll talk a little bit about it in a, in, in a moment. Um, but I wanted to highlight kind of two, um, what we've referred to as the newer studies. Um, they were follow up to those, those initial studies. And the first is looking at this idea around belonging and certainty. So, as it was mentioned, there's kind of different pieces that, that go into um, this idea of belonging. Um, and one of the things that was raised um, in some of our stakeholder briefings um, is that a lot of students feel kind of this uncertainty about they belong. So it's, it's, it's different than that connectedness, um, but it's really this idea that they're not sure if they are meant to be here. An example of this is um, when students complete this, it's now pre-matriculation. I'm concerned that I'm not ready for college coursework. So they they really are uncertain about um, about you know whether or not they belong in college. Um, and to highlight how critically important this this um, construct was um, for the 2016 cohorts, so the first cohort that we put this in for, 48% of students said this is a challenge for them. So a really really large number of students um, indicate that this is this is a challenge. Um, students, uh, we had in that same year some focus groups and interviews, um, and then also looking at, um, at research um, that's been done nationally. Um, we're interested in kind of what are the consequences of that. So when students have this belonging uncertainty, when they don't, they're really not sure if they're meant to be um, in college, um, you know, what, what did they talk about um, are some of the consequences of that, or what do we see as consequences of students feeling that way? Um, we see that they lose motivation when they perceive work as, as being difficult. Um, they feel like they're the only ones who don't belong, so they feel it's this kind of very isolated feeling. Students expect and are satisfied with grades that are lower than what they are capable of. And so students, when they feel uncertain, um, you know, they, they think, well, this is all I really am able to do, or, you know, I, I wasn't ready for college. I'm, I'm really not meant to be here. Um, and so they become satisfied with something and they think they deserve something when we know that they are capable of doing more. Um, and for underrepresented students, it can be a heightened uh, awareness of negative stereotypes and a perceived lack of similar students. Um, another kind of one of the newer studies that came out after the initial work um, looked at academic help seeking. Um, and, and I really see that these things um, have a lot of similarities. It's it's not um, it's not necessarily the same thing as belonging, but but when we talked to students about this experience, we saw that there was a lot of kind of belongingness um, in, in in embedded within this um, idea of academic help seeking, or that getting help for school is hard. Um, so an example item of this is I'd rather do poorly on an assignment I couldn't finish than ask for help. I would feel like a failure if I needed help in school. So getting help is really threatening. And again, back in that first cohort where we started to look at this, this was a challenge for 44% of our students. So again, almost half of the first year students said statements similar to this or, or agreed with similar statements similar to this, that they would rather fail than, than get help, that getting help is, is such a threatening experience. And so why, uh, we, you know, we went in and started to ask students, you know, why, why is this the case? Um, students think that instructors and faculty are scary. So this came up consistently. And, and we said, why? why, why do you find them scary? And they said, well, because our high school teachers and our high, and our high school college counselors told us that they were. They said that in college, nobody will care about you the way that we care about you here and in efforts to toughen them up they ultimately kind of made um, them feel scared um, and feel like they couldn't go to their faculty. And, and, it, and, and it has that kind of um, disconnection then, this, this lack of connectedness. Um, it facilitated a lack of connectedness. Um, students are concerned their instructors and faculty will think that they're dumb in their words. So they don't go and get help. Again, they don't feel like they belong. They, they are worried um, that they, um, you know, that they, they shouldn't be here, that faculty will think that, that they are not smart if they're going and getting help and that prevents them. 
Um, and it ultimately leads to students not talking to their advisors and, and to faculty when they have concerns. And these, these are things that students shared with us um, as part of these focus groups and interviews that we did to kind of unpack some of, some of this. Um, I see that I'm a little bit over time. Um, I'm just going to briefly mention um, two initiatives. I've got the, the links to the websites. Um, these are two university-wide um, initiatives um, that have been put in place um, to um, really bolster um, non-cognitive strengths, um, but also social belonging and, and, and feeling and sense of belonging um, in particular. Um, and I'll just briefly mention them. Um, but again, you, you've got the links for, for more information. Um, these are active current um, initiatives on, on campus. Um, so I mentioned the pre-matriculation inventory. Um, briefly, there's a lot of information on here, um, but briefly, um, we went through a, a very long process um, of collaborating with stakeholders on campus to say, okay, we, we're collecting all this information and how do we now put this into a useful tool that can be used to support students? And so the non-cognitive assets student profile tool um, was, was developed, um, we piloted it. Um, I'm going to briefly mention um, the wide number of, of campus stakeholders. Um, we had academic advisors, we had administrators, um, we had um, Joey Volpe, who's the director at the time, was the director of the Office of Advising Development. Um, she continues to really expand her portfolio around advising. Um, and, and the idea was is that we created a tool that, again, that is still being used. Um, and and you, if you go to that link, you can read more about it. Um, but it provides assessments of student strengths. Um, it's provided to advisors so that when they are engaged in advising, if students get an early alert, they can use this, they can understand, oh, getting help um, is, um, is a strength, or this student really um, felt connected and like, and, and, and like they belong. Um, and, and so how they advise students. Um, very briefly, so when thinking about belonging um, for in, in, in this model, using these um, assessment tools, um, we looked at, um, you know, specifically for Latinx students and in the 29 administration, so the, the administration kind of before the pandemic where a lot of these things really changed. Um, we looked at sense of belonging. So now because it's pre-matriculation, it has to be assessed. Do they feel connected in high school? Um, that has a very strong association with whether or not students end up feeling connected in college. So it's, it's a pretty good proxy. Um, and we see that generally speaking, um, Latinx students do feel like they belong um, in high school. We saw similar um, patterns um, back in the 2014 data when, they were, when it was administered um, post-matriculation or during their first year in college. Um, but where we see for Latinx students in particular, but for all students, is this idea around belonging and certainty. Um, and that this is a real area that we need to continue to support students um, to help them um, come into college, transition to college um, with, with um, greater certainty that they are meant to be here, that they have what it takes to be successful, that they are meant to be here. Um, and so we really need to be thinking about how do we promote this um, and, and the work that we do, particularly in, in that early transition, because we know it is critical for students to remain in college and to keep them re to keep them retained for them to to have that connectedness and also have that um, kind of inner knowledge that that they are meant to be here. Um, and I'm going to pause there. I'll just mention there is another initiative um, about with a program um, that was um, developed um, at UAC, part of a wider initiative. Um, to um, create a social belonging program, um, but I will leave it. I will leave it there. All right. Good morning, and thank you uh, for being here today. I'm really excited <clears throat> to share some research that I actually collaborated with uh, Dr. Frugia in my um, previous postdoc. So today I'm going to be talking about promoting a sense of belonging among Latina and Latino faculty and staff in STEM. Um, 
And just a little bit about who I am and where I'm from. Um, my sort of like educational journey began at UCSB, where um, like Nydia, I did the McNair Scholars Program and it was very formative in um, feeling like I belonged in academia and could potentially one day be a professor. Um, so while I was there, I also did a separate research opportunity through the Leadership Alliance, with, which also um, opened up other opportunities for research. Um, and then I uh, went to the University of Notre Dame, um, where I did my PhD in sociology. So there I was in the Center for Research on Educational Opportunity, where I was trained both quantitatively and qualitatively. Um, and once I finished at Notre Dame, um, I ended up doing a postdoc with uh, Dr. Frugia, who at the time was in undergrad affairs and academic programs, and then uh, transitioned to student affairs. And so my research there um, contributed to the On Track project. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that if people are interested. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to talk about where I am now. So I'm now um, a bridge to the faculty scholar or postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Medical Education. And um, it's been, uh, in terms of belonging, it's a very structured, mentored program, similar to McNair, but for the transition um, to the tenure track faculty route. Um, so I've been there for a little over a year, and then next year I'll, I'll start the tenure track assistant professor position um, in the department and in the College of Medicine. So that's just a little, about, a little bit about who I am and the path that I took. And I'm somewhere like way in the back in that picture can't really tell where I'm at, but I'm there. <laughs> so the uh, project that I'm going to talk about is titled, They Need to See Role Models, How Latinx Faculty and Staff Navigate the STEM Educational Pipeline. And just a roadmap of what I'm going to talk about. I'll give a little bit of context related to the background, the current study, uh, some of our research questions, um, data and methodology, a summary of the findings, and I'll end with conclusion and implications, and um, if, if there's time, I'll briefly talk about future research. So when we started the study, um, we didn't necessarily set out to necessarily think about belonging, but I think a lot of the themes that emerged ended up relating to belonging at the end of the day. Um, and so we know that there's research that shows that Latinx students are underrepresented in STEM careers and increasingly there's various pipeline programs that have tried to kind of remediate these gaps. Um, so. Oh, there you go. So um, previous research has highlighted how Latinx students have benefited from these programs as well as the role of mentorship um, to increase interest and retention in STEM related majors and careers. Um, and so for the current study, um, we argue that there is less research on the perspectives and experiences of Latinx faculty and staff um, who are involved in supporting students and contributing to these STEM pipeline programs. And so therefore, uh, you know, why should this matter? or Why does this matter? So uh, we think that the extent to which Latinx faculty and staff have access to resources and are able to strengthen these programs to improve Latinx representation throughout STEM has implications um, in working towards equity throughout the Latinx STEM edu educational pipeline. So the research questions that we um, set out to answer are how do Latinx faculty and staff understand their own racial and ethnic background? And then how does that relate to their involvement in promoting um, the Latinx STEM educational pipeline? So um, the participants for this study are eight Latinx faculty and or staff from one four-year university in the Midwest um, who are involved in supporting um, STEM pipeline programs for Latinx under, undergraduate students. Um, the method that we chose was a case study approach using semi-structured interviews over Zoom. And for the analysis um, of the interview data, we used open and focus coding of transcripts, allowing um, meaning to emerge. And I'm happy to elaborate on the methods um, and the data in the Q&A if there's time. So the findings are structured around three general themes. And so um, for the purposes of time, I will share one example from 
three of the sub themes that emerged uh, related to how um, or why Latinx faculty and staff do that do the work that they do, right? And so the first sub theme is around um, how faculty and staff uphold proud Latinx identities while guiding their work um, in order to benefit this next generation of Latinx STEM scholars. <clears throat> the second sub theme demonstrates how faculty and staff utilize their own Latinx backgrounds as a mechanism to then mold uh, critical STEM scholars. And I'll elaborate what I mean by critical STEM scholars. And the last sub theme will show um, the, the ways in which faculty and staff serve as what um, the research by Stanton Salazar uh, labels empowerment agents. So it's through these, um, how these faculty and staff serve as empowerment agents through their shared Latinx backgrounds with the students that they serve in these programs. And so again, this is um, an interview based project. So um, qualitative by nature. So the, the data that I have are quotes. And so in this example um, that I'm gonna first share with you comes from a staff member. And um, he says, people say, well, are you Mexican American? And I say, no, soy Mexicano, I'm Mexican, soy Latino. And I think, how does that impact or how does that relate to the program is the fact that I think it's, the reason why this office has been successful because it's part of our mission, but at the same time, we don't shy away from identity and we don't sugarcoat the fact that we're Latinos and we're intentionally going to work with Latinos. Um, and so in this example, this uh, particular staff member is making this rather strong connection between his own Latino identity and how that influences his approach towards serving Latinx students. And so the importance of Latinx identity is then built into this mission and to the work, but it also matters for the Latinx students that are trying to get into um, STEM majors. And so the implications of essentially infusing these like proud Latinx identities into um, how staff work with students is that it facilitates increased belonging, right, at the university generally. So by virtue of him being outwardly proud of his Latino or Mexican identity, it allows for students from the same racial and ethnic background to know that there's a place for them at the university and to be in STEM at the same time. So um, the second something sub theme around Latinx backgrounds and molding critical STEM scholars. So this particular, um, theme was inspired by a staff member who shared with me that um, in programming, students participated in dialogues where they were able to unpack why they were at the university as STEM majors. And so she um, shared that a lot of students talk about wanting to help the community in some way. And when they start to unpack um, things like, my grandma had diabetes and I want to solve that. Um, and she ends up telling me that the students end up repeating things that they hear in the media, right? So um, these stereotypes around Latino health um, and things like that. So that motivated her to have students that were STEM majors to engage in these dialogues, to be more critical of things that they've heard and the stereotypes around um, these issues. And so um, the staff members shares so I like to say that we complicate that by pointing out that for some of us, we live in food deserts. I'm really hoping that that's what our students can come out with being able to hopefully hear things and ask why, as opposed to just taking those things and putting the individual blame, pulling back and looking at the organizational societal larger framework. Um, so again, throughout programming, this staff member helps facilitate these dialogues that are intentionally equipping students with these more critical frameworks that allow students to use um, their experiences that are tied to their Latinx identities um, in their future STEM in their future STEM professions in a way that meets uh, the needs of their communities. And so the staff member indicates that it's not just about becoming a scientist or a doctor, um, but you have to critically engage with frameworks that accurately account for health disparities, challenges, and even opportunities. Um, that are surrounding Latinx communities. And so the implications of this quote uh, for how we can think about Latinx student belonging in this example is um, relates to how Latinx faculty and staff in STEM are providing these frameworks and curriculum. 
that allow for students to, again, fuse their STEM training with culturally relevant understandings of their communities and their lived realities. Oftentimes in STEM curriculum, um, it tends to be separated from any kind of like critical understanding of inequality. And instead, um, the staff member is using a very particular pedagogical approach to ensure that students can, um, again, understand their Latinx identity in relation to being in STEM. And so for the last sub theme, um, I have two examples to share. Um, and in this um, quote, the, the staff member says, I'm first generation and you know the research has indicated too that Latinos need to see them. They need to see role models, whether they're advisors or whether they're doctors, they're Latinos, so that they can see that they can see themselves being there one day. So I think that's important and I think that's where it intersects, but I'm not a physician, but I'm someone that can still advocate or can empower them to advocate for themselves and pursue their health path, their career path. And so in this kind of uh, quote, the staff member focuses on the shared um, backgrounds that she has with students that she advises. So, you know, she's Latinx herself. She's also first generation in college. And so she uses that to leverage kind of like trust and rapport with her students. And, um, you know, this also this shared background also allows her to, to then serve as a role model um, for students that are at the university. So, she uses um, her positionality in turn to identify resources and advise students in a manner that in turn empowers them. And, um, you know, she really makes the case for why her role is needed to continuing the opportunities for Latinx students interested in STEM. And another example from the same staff member, uh, which I thought was really interesting, um, she talks about why um, students tend to like prefer to or confide in her for for advising in the pre medical pathway, and um, she shares. But it's the fact that I'm Latina and I understand where they're coming from. They keep coming to me as opposed to a white person who's telling them. And then in the interview, she made a pretentious voice, and she says, "Well, I don't know if you should pursue biology because you're not going to make it." You know, I think that's a big difference. So I think that all plays into hey, she looks like me, I trust her, I can identify with her, and you know, that's huge. And so she's retelling the story of students who have gone to her after going to another advisor beforehand who says like, yeah, don't even try biology because it's really hard, you probably won't make it. And so she is kind of working against that and showing how, again, in acts of non-belonging, right, someone telling you don't belong in biology, uh, she's combating that by attempting to advise students and um, provide them the resources to, to empower them and say, no, you, you should belong in biology and we do need more um, Latinx representation in STEM majors across the university. Um, so again, she, she realizes that the trust and the ways that she can empower students comes from her kind of shared background of um, being Latina, being first generation, and oftentimes coming from the same communities that the students come from. Um, so, so overall, some conclusions and implications um, refer to this question of how can we really foster inclusivity, equity, and long-term success for Latinx identifying people. Um, and I think that with this study, we shared that um, or it demonstrates the valuable contributions that Latinx faculty and staff are providing for this next generation of Latinx STEM scholars through acts of belonging. So the challenge that I think remains is that there are still too few Latinx faculty and staff in these roles that are supporting our students um, with these empowering messages around identity and providing opportunities and resources to continue in the STEM pipeline. And so, um, you know, the, the pipeline also matters for how we can get more Latinx folks in these faculty and staff positions. And the implications of the study are that oftentimes when research is conducted to understand, um, you know, the effectiveness of certain programs, um, it tends to focus on the students who are receiving the programming, which is like really, really important to do that research. Um, but I think 
what this study or what we tried to highlight in the study is that it also is important to highlight and honor you know, the experiences and the voices of faculty and staff that are on the grounds helping these students um, in ways that facilitate belonging in STEM opportunities. And just like one last point that I wanna make um, in relation to these pipeline programs and um, things that I've been a beneficiary of in, in, in my own trajectory is that oftentimes um, the challenge is that they are grant funded. And so um, what that means is that when grant money runs out, then the program could, um, can no longer exist. And so the ultimate goal is to then institutionalize successful programs that um, are contributing to strengthening um, the STEM pipeline. So I just wanna put that out there um, because again, by institutionalizing these programs, we can uh, continue to work against structural inequalities and barriers that continue to um, pervade um, the underrepresentation of minoritized folks in the pipeline. So uh, with my rather new transition to the Department of Medical Education, um, my research agenda is kind of, well, is pivoting to focus more on the context of medical school. And so um, I will now I'm currently undergoing a new project that engages with the community cultural wealth framework, and I'm trying to understand how that is activated um, and experienced among Latinx medical students and trainees in the transition to and through medical school into the physician um, pipeline. And so through this project, I will be able to um, kind of explore issues of belonging through the community cultural wealth framework. So I'm very excited to um, use this framework and my previous training and focus on uh, Latinx medical students um, and trainees. So with that, um, thank you for coming to this talk. And um, I would just like to give these folks a shout out and um, yeah, thank you. Okay, um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Marisol Jimenez. I am a second year PhD student at the University of Illinois, and um, I am working a part of the research team um, that is working with IMAS today. Um, we are working to create something tangible to be able to bring back to Vice Chancellor Tim Colleen. So I want you all to know that um, your feedback and your thoughts are important. And I will do my best to present all of our ideas that we talk about today um, in an actionable way and create a good plan for us to best support Latinx students at the University of Illinois. So in these 45 minutes, I really want us to be able to create a community space where we can discuss like some of the ways that we believe we can increase student sense of belonging. So I was thinking we can talk about anything as far as like how can we support students who are transitioning to the University of Illinois um, and to ensure that they're like successfully transitioning, ensuring that they're having a good experience, that we're having retention and that students are just able to find community spaces. Um, so with that, I want us to start kind of thinking around different initiatives, resources, centers, workshops, um, classes, anything that we think would increase belonging for students. Um, and I mean, if you feel free to also share if you've had moments where you feel like you haven't belonged and how that would be able to, like what are some plans that we can create to change that experience moving forward. Um, so if anyone, and that's my kitty in the background, you'll, you'll hear him throughout um, the time, but if anyone wants to initially share any ideas that they may have, from Dr. Ferugia's talk, I was surprised to hear um, that students um, like are afraid to ask for help at the university because of one message or part of the reason is about is related to um, they were told in high school by their teachers that uh, college is much more serious, like no one has time for you, like your professors um, kind of like leave them alone, like don't ask for help, like figure stuff out on your own. And so I think that's the wrong message to be like, um, 
communicating to high school students that are like in the transition to college. And so I think instead there should be kind of um, increased communication and to bridge that gap between high school and college to really um, communicate that like, no, you should be asking for your for help from professors and to, to be engaged and not to be afraid to go to office hours. Um, and I think that there's a lot of misconceptions, like as a first gen college student myself, there, there's a lot of misconceptions that we have about, um, you know, what is how what is the right way to do college and how are you able to interact with faculty, right? Um, and just like to share a brief example, uh, currently I'm a, advising a medical student uh, for like a research elective this semester and she's, you know, first gen Latina. And um, in our first encounter, she kind of apologized to me for like saying too much or like doing too much. And I said, you know, like, hold on, like, don't ever feel like you have to apologize for your experiences, for who you are. Um, and so I think that if we're able to kind of bridge the gap, like on the high school side, but also like on the faculty side, because perhaps she had never heard from a faculty member that like, you never have to apologize for who you are and where you come from. Like you, you belong at the medical school um, and you have a lot of contributions to make, right? Um, so I thought that was really interesting how she kind of framed that and like communicated with me. And I was, um, you know, very intentional with how I said, like, you, you matter, like, don't ever apologize for um, the way you communicate or what you're kind of telling me at this moment. So yeah, I just wanted to share that. Yeah, Nicole, thank you so much for sharing. I definitely remember hearing similar sentiments in high school um, about who we could reach out to or how college was gonna be a very individualistic experience when in reality, it really does take so much community, right? To get through all of these spaces, undergrad and graduate school. Um, thank you so much for sharing so i heard a little bit of like bridging the community um between high school and college what, what role do you think that faculty has in this or how do you envision maybe faculty creating this space for students um if you have any ideas if not anyone yeah else i mean i don't i don't know like how many faculty are aware that um they are getting this messaging in high school. So like if I was a faculty teaching like first year undergrad students, like when we talk about the syllabus, I would potentially like give a shout out to, um, you know, or kind of like talk about how I'm always accessible, that you could come to my office hours um, and kind of like, um, what is it like? get rid of the myths, like potentially, like you could have heard this about how you engage with faculty and that's not true. Like, I'm here to tell you that instead I am approachable. You like, you should come talk to me. There shouldn't be this like um, kind of hierarchical um, like divide between faculty and students. And, and especially at UIC, like UIC has a, a huge first gen college student population. And so I think that if you're a faculty member at UIC, the least you could do is to um, make that known um, and to to do what you can like in your syllabus to to bring out that messaging that um, that they are accessible and that you you shouldn't be afraid to ask for help basically. Um, I I I think that um, you know we we talked a little bit about context and then, and I think that the if we're just looking at the University of Illinois system schools, um, but I know there's colleagues from other universities, um, you know, different different people are, are kind of in different places, have different students um, in, in, in this work. And so um, I think it's important if, if recommendations are being made um, to, to recognize that the universities are in different places. Um, and I, <laughs> and and frankly have different um, funding access, we'll say. Um, and and so I think um, you know I, I I think UAC has has um, with we heard a little bit about Lara's Latino Cultural Center, um, the Hispanic Center of Excellence. I don't think was was mentioned Las Ganas. 
you know, there's a lot of these really um, important initiatives and programs that that have done tremendous work. And but I do I do think we have to think about how and, and as, as Nicole talked about sustainable funding, and and how we ensure that that um, the people who are running the programs aren't consistently worried about funding, um, because a lot of them are established based on grants. And and so how do we how do we um, ensure um, that the funding is there to to do the work? Um, so that um, the faculty and staff who are leading these efforts um, can focus in on on the work and and not chasing money. Thank you, Sue. Um, so I'm thinking about funding, and so I'm not sure how the funding goes. If if they have to apply and reapply every year, but how do you envision something more sustainable would kind of look like as far as the grants um, for these programs? There should be dedicated dollars. And, and so this is, this is my opinion. Um, I will, you know, I one of one of the um, successes of, of Laura's is that that they're they have they have dedicated dollars. Um, and um, you know, and 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 they, uh, you know, and then and they know that it's there because it's it's because because it's in the budget. So they've been able to do really truly profoundly important work at at UIC. Um, and um, and when we see these efforts that are that are highly successful, um, grants from Department of Education, if we're getting grants from foundations, wherever it's coming from. Um, and we're able to demonstrate the benefits to students, then there, there's, there needs to be a mechanism to intentionally target dollars towards these types of programs that, that are essential. A little bit about LATIS um, and other institutional programs. Um, so which programs are the ones that I guess are the most successful um, for Latinx students? <laughs> I mean, I... I, I... I, I think that the, the ones that I just named in, in, in different ways are all, at UAC are all critical. So Lara's Latino Cultural Center, Hispanic Center of Excellence, um, Las Ganas, and I'm missing one. Who am I missing? Oh, Nicole, do you, do you know? I, I'm, I'm probably missing somebody and I, I don't need to undermine anyone's work but I mean I, th those are those are I mean those are four um that that are I think that are kind of critical at, at, at UIC at least and there's, yeah. prob there's probably more and I'm forgetting them are you do you work at UIC currently or I do yeah, yeah. so like what part of the I guess what programming is it that they put together that we can maybe try to like highlight like if there's something within one of these that has been successful or that you have seen that maybe we can highlight as like a point to this is like this organization puts this together which helps with sense of belonging and this is why we need to fund them at different institutions just to be able to be replicated I think I think considering still again right that we're serving different students at different at these three institutions, but just thinking about like what programming is the most um, successful so that we can advocate for more of the funding for the programming for the organizations. Different ways do really, really important. Um, they do all, they all do really important work. Um, I, I will own my, my that I am impartial because I'm, I'm the, I'm the, I, I use Alfonso as the, as the PI, um, but I am a co-PI in the Les Dennis Project. Um, but which is a newer one. It was funded by the Department of Education. Um, we are um, the the grant is done, um, and so we're looking we're looking for funding. But that program, um, and 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 Liz May, I saw Liz was is she still in this? I don't know. If she's in the room. She's the director. Liz Ramirez is she still um, on this? And um, they so I help on the research side of it and. Um, they have been able to demonstrate retention gains. Um, Fifty percent of the the fellows, so it's a it's a research fellowship program, um, and the, and there's efforts to kind of get students ready for research. There's transition coaching. There's mentoring, um, and 
but the the fellowship program um, and they partner with with the Latino Cultural Center. They partner with Lars. They partner with HCLE. Um, but we have about 50 percent of the students who graduate from that program um, go on to graduate school. It's it's profoundly high. So we have students going to um, PhD programs, master's programs, medical school, dental school, like you, you name it. Um, they're they're um, they are and they are well prepared. Um, because of that. So we see the kind of the immediate benefits um, and of, um, of, of retention um, at graduation. And then we, we are, they are really successfully building out a pipeline. A key component of this is, is around belonging. Um, so one of the, um, you know, they, 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 they really ensure that they have um, experiences where they connect with other Latinx students with staff and faculty in the research labs. Um, so it's, 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 um, it's, a, it's a really amazing program that they, that they have developed um, that I have the honor of, of working on with them. Um, again, all four of those that I mentioned though are, are profoundly great, but I, I, I have impartiality because um, I've, I've been able to work on that project. Yeah, that, that, that sounds incredible. That's very similar to my experience with McNair at, I went to the university, or I went to Champaign for undergrad, and I had a very similar experience going through a research program and learning alongside a cohort and building community there definitely also helped my sense of belonging. Since, um, to uh, highlight Las Ganas, I feel like I have to highlight um, the Hispanic Center of Excellence um, now that I'm on the, the West Campus. And uh, so the Hispanic Center of Excellence has been around for um, over 30 years, and they have been credited for uh, the increase of Latinx physicians in the state of Illinois. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's been around and it's done um, great work. And so they offer programming for um, Latinx students uh, while they're in high school to kind of facilitate the transition to thinking about like pre-med, kind of the pipeline into getting into medical school eventually. Uh, so not only do they support like local high school students in the community, but they also have parent programming, which is pretty cool because they bring in parents and um, they kind of, again, bridge this gap between um, the, they provide resources to kind of understand how to help support their their children in this um, transition to thinking about medical school as an option. Um, I I know that they've also struggled with like funding. Um, so again, like the the common thread is kind of this like how do we get these institutional commitments, especially when we're able to prove through like research and outcomes that um, many students have benefited. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's they're doing great work, and I hope to I hope that they don't lose funding or that they um, kind of go away because. And similarly, like as a McNair scholar, I remember when I was in college, um, a lot of McNair programs closed because federal funding was like tight. Um, I would love to see a McNair scholars program at UIC. Um, I'm not sure if it ever existed. Mm -hmm. um, but as like someone who benefited and knows kind of like the the importance, um, but yeah, it's there are good programs. It's just how do we again to to hammer home the funding point? How do we um, make sure that those dollars are there and we're not having to kind of like reinvent the wheel or get another grant to kind of start over, right? Thank you, Nicole. Yeah, I, I actually, I don't know if UIC does or ever did, but I do remember my McNair, I guess, the leader of the program every year was very stressed to make sure that she reached the numbers. Because I think if after a few years of you not reaching your quota of the percentage of students who end up going to graduate school, then the program would get cut or underfunded, or I'm not sure how it went, but I do remember that being very stressful for her as she was trying to like help us all get into graduate school and ensure success, but also having to 
have all of that stress of trying to guarantee that a good percentage of us would end up going to graduate school. So what that looked like was a little bit difficult. Um, I, I also was thinking a little bit about, Nicole, what you said about professors and kind of how we can become more available to our students or just seem like more approachable. And I think like even in graduate school, it's difficult to know which ones of your professors, like how to reach out to them, right? Like I wouldn't know how to reach out to them if I've never had a connection with them. And so like, what does that look like? And having to go out of your way to email them, all of that is very stressful. And maybe you can all can help me imagine this, but thinking of like doing like welcome events with your professors, like a luncheon, a cookies and coffee. Um, I'm thinking of how students can get to know their colleges. And I do know like as a freshman, you know, we everyone is like, you could also switch colleges or you could be um, undeclared. But for those who go in and they're like, I'm gonna be a teacher and, and they stay through, then I think like maybe having some of those spaces available where um, professors can dedicate time might be useful. I don't know, does anyone have any insight or anything to add? I think it's, I think the classroom is really important. Um, it, you know, it, it sets the tone. So I, I think that if, 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 because I, I don't think that faculty do this to, to be off-putting. I think sometimes they just don't, they just don't think or they don't know. And, and so, um, you know, if, if, if there can be opportunities for, for training, but, but really clear examples of things that they should, they should do and say. So what should they put in their syllabus? To what should they say in that first day of class when they're when they're going through when they're going through their syllabus, and 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 what are the um, what are the messages they need to give to students? You know, come come to office hours and and this idea that like smart kids go to office hours it it, it doesn't mean you're not capable. You know, so giving some of those really clear messages. Um, I, I didn't have it in the presentation, but one of the suggestions that is that a student raised in the in the focus group was that. Um, they want to be told that they can go to office hours with somebody. And so it's not so scary having to like go into the office by themselves. So tell them, that, you know, again, like it's, it's these things that faculty need to be told, like these are the things to say, so they don't have to try to figure it out themselves because they're, they're not, you know, they're, they're trained to be brilliant in their areas, but this, is, this isn't their training. And so, um, and so how do we give them this, the strategies to, to make um, their classrooms and, and to make um, engaging with students um, less, less threatening for the students and, and more welcoming? Symposiums, I feel like that's how the students there feel and the faculty there feel. Um, so I'm thinking about you know, U of I, and I don't know if UIC has this, but they have a, like Latinx parents weekend and, and they bus in parents from Chicago and they have um, multicultural events and they help feel like help with families feeling connected to the university. Um, and I wonder if UIS has something like this or if um, UIC has something like this for their parents as well. The UIC, Lara's has family weekend. So they, they do a really fantastic job um, bringing families to campus. It's It's been slow the, because of the pandemic, but they've, they've been doing this for, for a very long time. And so Lara's is, Lara's does have funding, correct? Yeah. Like institutional funding? Um, my understanding is that it's state. It's state like funded. Mm -hmm. I, I am sure it's, they would be happy with additional resources. I, 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 can't, I cannot speak for them, um, but they don't know that they have allocation. And for students to feel afraid to ask for help um, in order to feel, I guess, like they have a community at school, is there anything else anyone would want to add? Any other thoughts we're kind of thinking through? Um, and this statement is very much informed by my work with um, Sue. So um, 
when we think about student belonging, um, the first year matters a lot. And that's when um, students um, we know like if they retain that first year that we'll like have a better chance of keeping them and that they'll graduate from the university. And so when we're thinking about kind of like inter interventions, um, programming and things like that, um, if we have limited dollars, um, I think that the first year of college is where um, kind of should probably be prioritized. And um, I know Sue has talked about like the the advice and the alerts that um, advisors get with students that might be struggling um, academically, but also like belonging factors into to that struggle as well. Um, but all that to say, like, to emphasize the importance of the first year of college, basically, first semester yeah. too. Yeah. Do, can you speak a little bit about I advise? I'm not sure. I'm familiar. I'll let Sue do that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sue, so much for all your help today. No, it's fine. Um, so this this is something that's um, run out of academic affairs, um, but it was it's still in academic affairs when they were launching it. But Joey Volpe's the campus expert. Um, it's it's it uses the Starfish product, um, and it's a communication system among um, faculty and, and 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 advisors in a lot of ways. So um, if if a student is isn't doing well, in a class, a faculty member can send an alert through the iAdvice system. Um, that alert then goes to um, their college advisors plus any success unit um, advisors or coaches that work with the students um, to let them know that there's a concern and to meet with the student to talk through the concern. Um, so that's 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 a key mechanism, um, but there's. It, it can be beyond just the academic concerns. So if a student um, is experiencing food insecurities, they can make a referral to the Dean Office of the Dean of Students or Housing Insecurities. Referrals can be made um, for things beyond, um, you know, beyond the beyond academics. Yeah. Do you, does do you know if you guys have an OMSA center? A what um, center? The OMSA Center, the, uh, it's a Office of Minority Student Affairs. Uh, well, we have a vice chancellor. So for Amalia Payers, who is the, gave the welcome, she's, she is um, a vice chancellor for diversity. So, um, I mean, there, there's a whole like division um, that is, is focused in on diversity. Yeah, I I think as you were talking about I advise, I was thinking about um, like maybe one on one mentors for first year students. Um, I don't know if I know that like I have seen that where they have like graduate students serving like 20, 20 undergraduate students one on one um, and they just have like once a month meetings as check ins, but thinking about how sometimes when you have a question and as an undergrad and you're like is this a stupid question and who do I ask and no question is stupid you just don't know and you don't know where to look and sometimes you just need someone to be like if I have a cold where do I just go get a cold pack or any question of the sort how um potentially like having one-on-one -on -one mentorship for um like underrepresented students might look like at the university and how helpful that might be to kind of bridge that first year to ensure a sense of belonging. We we do have um mentoring. We have we have peer, there it we're pretty decentralized, I would say, with our peer mentoring efforts. So Las Ganas has a very successful um, peer mentoring program. Um uh, our um uh, academic center for excellence does um for, for students um, as does AAAN, which is a support center for black and African-American students. Um, so, so they're there, um, but it's, it's, it is decentralized. Um, so I think that, um, you know, it's, it's kind of who, it's, it's for whoever signs up. And sometimes the most um, vulnerable students, um, you know, they're less likely to sign up. Is, is, is always a challenge, but I think, you know, and it's it's probably something that can be expanded. Again, it, it always comes down to resources, so. 
Thank you everyone for sharing. Um, it has been super helpful for me. I can't wait to write this up and do all of our conversations justice um, when I'm able to present this to the vice chancellor. So everyone, uh, thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to be here. Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, wherever um, today finds you. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And it's really exciting to be here and share some of my work with you all and have a conversation with you all um, in this session. As I mentioned in my uh, intro, my name is Mary Duenas and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, before I kind of get started with my talk, I always like to talk a little bit about who I am to um, share, just share where I come from. And, and uh, I, I just find that to be important as we think about some of this work. Um, so I am originally from Pasadena, California, where both of my parents um, are from Central America. And so I am a first generation college student and I was encouraged to attend college after completing um, high school. And so I earned a bachelor's degree at the University of California, Irvine in criminology, law, and society. Uh, during my time there, I was very involved with peer educational programs that were focused on academic success. I did a lot of coaching and um, did a lot of support and collaborative work around the community. Um, and so some of that really led to my work at Wisconsin, where I pursued my a graduate work. And I, I should say that at Irvine, I was engaged in research and I really found a, a, a connection to doing some of this work. And, and at the time I was focused on academic success. And so when I got to Wisconsin, um, I started to have a lot of questions and my advisor at the time uh, started to like say like, we can you know think about some of this moving forward. And that's where this idea or connection or um, concept for me in terms of sense of belonging really connected for me. And, um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that, but more so this relationship between sense of belonging and imposter syndrome. Um, and what does that mean? And so um, I will give some context moving forward. So the motivation for conducting this research on imposter syndrome stems partly as a result um, of understanding how folks May have a sense of belonging or affinity to a particular location or a place or a group of people while also feeling or perhaps experiencing the imposter syndrome. And so this sparked an interest in understanding and figuring out what is the connection between sense of belonging and imposter syndrome, specifically among Latinx college students. And so to provide a brief description of Latinx students in higher education, Latinx students uh, may have attained some modest gain in population. However, um, educational inequity gains have not kept pace with these population increases. To provide a picture of Latinx students in higher education, Huber, uh, Perez Huber excuse me, and colleagues share that out of every 100 Latina uh, um, elementary students, 63 will graduate from high school, 13 will receive an undergraduate degree, four will graduate with a master's or professional degree, and fewer than one will graduate with a doctorate. Um, as for Latino male counterparts, scholarships suggest a vanishing number of Latino males in the educational pipeline. It is likely that Latinx students understand the steep odds they may uh, must endure to be successful in higher education, Yet little research has been done to understand how Latinx students perceive their college experiences relative to the larger educational um, disparities that do not favor them. The focus of, the, of my work is to understand the experiences of Latinx college students who may experience imposter syndrome. As of 2021, um, an estimated uh, 62.5 million Latinx individuals reside in the United States accounting for 19% of the total U.S. population. We know that higher education institutions provide an, an environment where students can expand their worldviews and find a, their place in society. A culture of inclusion on campus is necessary to ensure all students can grow and learn successfully. However, Latinx students are often left out of this story. With the rising number of Latinx students, um, in population, attending to how imposter syndrome plays out in the, 
in the lives of college students is needed. And so while there are changes in college enrollment for Latinx students, these enrollment increases do not mirror the graduation rate and these disparities continue to exist. Multiple studies document the prevalence of the imposter phenomenon among numerous student population. Chang and colleagues uh, discussed the cultural mismatch between independent university settings, for example, individualistic culture, and the interdependent familial environment, so for example, the collectivistic, collectivistic culture. One reason might be that institutions are uh, usually set up in a way that does not respond culturally to these students which leads to this intra-group intra marginalization, uh, cultural incongruity, and a negative perception of university environment. Um, scholars who study Latinx students in higher education provide both deficit-based and asset-based models for understanding the collegial experience. And a way to begin to solve the puzzle of Latinx students struggling in higher education, I examine imposter syndrome to better understand how Latinx students think about themselves and their experiences at a predominantly white institution. The majority of my research on imposter syndrome uses a, a quantitative methods like a survey methodology. Um, and there is a gap in the literature on the Latinx college student day-to-day -day experiences when it's related to imposter syndrome. And so to give context to today's topic, I'd like to talk about sense of belonging. I know we've talked uh, a little bit about that this morning. Um, and so um, just to give some context to this, to this talk, uh, within the broader literature um, on equity in higher education, a sense of belonging has um, become an important focus, and as it should be, um, defined as one's a sense of being accepted, valued, included, and encouraged by others. Uh, whether it's teachers or peers. A sense of belonging is a, a documented predictor for academic success and retention in college. In a specific study, Nunez focused on sense of belonging among Latinx OWL students in college, finding that positive cross-racial interactions, engagement with a diverse curriculum, and participating in community service activities positively influence a sense of belonging. The literature demonstrates that a sense of belonging is an important factor for collegial success. And so the purpose of the project is to understand the experiences of Latinx students who may experience imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome, commonly known as the imposter phenomenon, is this pervasive feeling of self-doubt, insecurity, or feeling of intellectual uh, fraudulence. Little is known by race and ethnicity as it relates to IS, since these feelings are not unique. Likely, additional barriers for Latinx students as they begin to understand the ways in which the, their post-secondary goals are threatened. And so uh, the purpose for this work was to understand the experiences of Latinx college students who may experience imposter syndrome. The first research question is, how, when, and where do Latinx college students experience imposter syndrome at a predominantly white institution if they do? And second, how do Latinx students cope with the imposter syndrome during college? And so the theory that guided my research was um, lat crit. It encompasses all of the assumptions and underpinnings of critical race theory. Lat crit explores multidimensional identities and can address the intersectionality of racism, sexism, classism, immigration status, and other forms of oppression. Scholars encourage the use of lat crit among other scholars. Um, they argue that while not as popular as critical race theory, lat crit offers a roadmap that has the potential to supplement uh, work on race and identity. In terms of uh, recruitment participant uh, and data collection and data analysis, there were a total of 14 participants and participants were interviewed three times. Each uh, interviewed uh, lasted about uh, 30 to 40 minutes for an average of 120 minutes per participant. 
For the data collection, the project um, utilized a semi-structured interview for an in-depth exploration of meaning making through the experience of the Latinx students. Siedemann said that the use of three interviews uh, series helped dive deeper into context and helps establish trust among the participants. In this approach, each uh, data source contributes to the broader and more in-depth understanding of the stories of Latinx students. Um, as for data analysis, I used a data reduction technique that yields a lot of data, as you may imagine, and used a research, uh, the research questions really to help me keep an uh, open mind about identifying those larger themes through the use of uh, lat crit analysis. At the end of the third interview, I asked participants about their identities. Here is a short representation of the participants based on gender, sexual orientation, class standing, and ethnicity. Among the participants, eight self-identified as female and four self-identified as male. Most of the participants self-identified as heterosexual, upper division, and Mexican or Mexican-American students. And so now I'm going to talk uh, about the themes and probably the most important and exciting part of this uh, talk, I would say. Um, and so um, it was an honor just to be able to share this and, and, and listen to these stories um, and share this with you here. So the first theme was um, not claiming success. To what do students attribute their success to? In this first theme, participant ex uh, express the external factors that contributed to their success. The second theme was a break during the COVID-19 global pandemic. While the transition to virtual learning during the COVID-19 global pandemic was difficult for many, participants felt like the, uh, the pandemic minimized their feelings of imposter syndrome. The third theme was the mechanism used to cope with imposter syndrome. Participants found the need to surround themselves with supportive groups as a way to find strength and cope with these feelings. The final theme was specific institutional change to address student needs. Participants felt the lack of support from the institution and desire to witness institutional change, which included a, redistrib a redistribution of student resources to target the Latinx student community. Participants provided tangible and concrete recommendations that university leaders and personnel can implement in order to create a more equitable and more inclusive environment for students. And two specific demands uh, were the need to redistribute funds and need for mental health services. Next, I'd like to share quotes from each participant as it relates to each of these themes. Um, the first theme was Latinx college students who experience imposter syndrome and how they attributed their success to factors other than their hard work or capabilities. In the first quote, Christina, a, a neurobiology major, discussed how she diminished her own accomplishments, that it wasn't 100% because of her hard work. It was because of the curve. Here, she, uh, here we can see that the student failed to attribute her success to her commitment for education and instead suggests that the overall class performance was the true reason for her, for her academic accomplishments. Rather than recognizing her own um, accomplishments, she attributed her success to various circumstances, in this case, the class curve. In addition, we saw Elizabeth, a textile and fashion design major who attributed her success to an outside source. She suggests that her success was a result of the institution's needs to meet a particular quota. She stated, you're only here for the diversity count. You're only here for the quota. You're not really here because you deserve to be here. As we can see, these Latinx college students experience IS and share their reasons for why they were successful. Um, they then express their national uh, rationale, ultimately making this an individualistic approach to an institutional problem. 
the problem being a lack of diversity and inclusion at their institution. The second theme attends, uh, attends to the impact of the COVID-19 global pandemic. The following quote highlights um, the changes that students experience as a result of this pandemic. To begin, many of the students suggest that the pandemic allowed them to truly focus on their learning. The virtual platform gifted students with the opportunity to be uh, themselves and truly learn the course material. This was seen with Lucia, an education major who stated, I feel that with the pandemic, I have remained who I am. I am comfortable. On the contrary, when it comes to a regular semester, walking into a classroom full of white students, I would, I would get very intimidated. I would start doubting myself and I would start being almost on attack mode. Lucia described her imposter syndrome experiences as um, different between pre-pandemic classroom engagement and during COVID-19 classroom engagement. She particularly called attention to the use of the webcam as giving her a break from the racial ex from the from racial exclusion on campus. For this reason, her preference was the use of online platform because it minimized her feelings of IS. Andy, a rehabilitation psychology major, stated, the imposter syndrome, I don't really feel it because we're all behind a computer screen. And it's like, if you don't want to talk, you don't necessarily are forced to. It's in a different environment. Here we see that another Latinx student experienced IS to a slightly lesser extent because of the online environment he was forced to experience as a result of the pandemic. The stressors that come with being in a classroom set, uh, setting were eliminated, gifted, giving them a more fruitful learning experience behind the webcam. Finally, we have Anna, a social work major who stated, it's nice because if someone makes a comment and you're uncomfortable, you can just turn off your audio and video off and step away from the class. This showed that the shift to online learning as a result of the global pandemic allowed students to gain a type of control. This virtual platform liberated uh, these students and ultimately minimized their feelings of IS. Although there were many negative assumptions made regarding the shift to online learning, the data showed that the Latinx students benefited when it comes to minimizing feelings of imposter syndrome. The third theme attended to how um, self-identified Latinx students participated, uh, participants cope with the imposter syndrome. To begin, Anna, a social work major said, going to the cultural center and surrounding myself with other students of color, other first generation college students, other women. It's also super empowering to know that I'm not alone and I'm not the only one who feels this way. There are others who are facing similar struggles as me. Here, Anna, along with other participants, coped with the, by surrounding themselves with others who support them and uplift them. As we can see, the participants searched for support, um, support groups who are welcoming and who share similar experiences as them. These communities provided a sense of confidence and temporarily relieved the feelings of imposter syndrome uh, the students experienced on campus. We also see this with Luna, an education and social double and Spanish, uh, excuse me, um, double major who said, the other day, I, the other way I cope with these experiences has been talking to many individuals that reassure me, just getting things off my mind, just off my chest helps me. It reaffirms my value and potential. Here we have a student who was not only searching for a support system in others, but who also was searching for validation and for others who truly understand. Luna talked about how she felt unworthy of her accomplishment and how she searched for academic advisors to help her through this negative mindset. 
Ultimately, these students cope with IS by searching for others who share their identities in hopes to avoid experiencing these feelings alone. And for the fourth and final theme, participants highlighted the, uh, the foundation for how the university was built, uh, for example, policies and practices, and the need for change in order to facilitate success for Latinx students' population. This theme was focused on the institution. Students pointed out how the university lacked inclusion. Um, students emphasized particular ways in which uh, to re restructure or reconstruct some of the institutional habits in order to create an environment of success for the Latinx communities. Marco, a psychology and special education major, explained an incongruence between what the university states and what it does. He says, it's like they want the idea of you, but they don't actually want you to be at the table. He reflects on how the institution's values, mission, and vision does not reflect the student's experience. He expressed a deep frustration because the institution advertises diversity and, and pledged to support the Latinx college community, but, it, but at its core, Marco feels the exact opposite. He shared sadness to know that the institution was not built with the needs of Latinx college students now. And as I, you know, transition over here, uh, just a couple of action items. Um, how do you plan to help and encourage leaders to create important spaces for change? Um, this includes belonging as well. And how do you use your knowledge to change the progress conversations with friends, families, colleagues, and peers? And so with that, um, thank you all for uh, listening and, and uh, to my talk here. I will um, stop sharing my screen and turn it over to um, Olivia. Doctoral student in EPOL. So it's nice to meet you, Dr. Duenas. Um, one of the things I've been wondering about, we've been doing a lot of reading about Latinx students uh, in our courses, of course, and their inclusion in the contemporary university. And I know that the whole vexed political issue of how people receive and support or do not support on campuses uh, undocumented students um, can be very concerning for other Latinx students on campus. I was wondering with international students from, uh, you know, Mexico and so on, do they have the same concerns about this issue when they're on the American campus as domestic students from Latinx backgrounds would have? What is the kind of variation about their feelings and how does it affect their sense of belonging here? Absolutely. Nice to meet you, Kelly. Um, I believe so. There's definitely important work that, you know, scholars who focus on undocumented um, and documented folks or students um, highlight. Uh, my sense and uh, just knowing a little bit about the literature is that it's not only this, but it's added layers to the complex of other identities that, you know, some of us, even in this room, hold privilege, whether it's U.S. citizenship. And so I think that there's um, good work and a lot of work needed to kind of expand on this, um, because my sense is that it's not just these um, experiences, but rather or struggles or, or anything like that, but rather it's much more nuanced and um, much more um, layered um, given the political climate, specifically even now, as we um, you know saw in the last election. And so, yeah, I would say that um, the folks, international students um, in the sense have a, a, a different for sure experience as, um, that hasn't been highlighted or that needs to continue to be highlighted. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, super excited to be sharing space with you all. Uh, and my presentation is titled Foregrounding Gender and Sexuality in Serving Latinx AO Communities. 
So a little bit about myself. My name is Antonio Duran. My pronouns are he, him, his, él. Uh, and I'm currently an assistant professor at Arizona State University, um, which rests upon the ancestral homeland of the Akimal Odam um, and Pipash nations. Uh, and my work in, in higher ed uh, oftentimes looks at uh, how is it that people and members of the Latinx AO community experience these intersecting systems of power and marginalization. So I was just catching the last little bit of the conversation right now, and Dr. Duenas was talking a little bit about undocumented status, um, and I think that that uh, brings to light how the Latinx AO community is by no means a monolith, right? And in fact, we all experience various layers of identity and systems of marginalization that then influence our opportunities, our access, our experiences within post-secondary education. And so there's some nice connections to be made between the last presentation and this one. And specifically, um, I frequently examine ideas of gender and sexuality. And this is partly due to my own experiences as someone who identifies as a queer, cisgender, Latino man, um, in where I think about how is it that gendered norms, gendered systems, how is it that heteronormativity, how did that trans oppression um, all play a role in how Latinx AO students experience belonging um, within an institution or may not experience belonging. And so to, in order to enter into this conversation, uh, I try to focus my, my research on extending and challenging myths within the Latinx AO community, um, pulling on some of the authors that you're seeing right now on the slide. I'm thinking about how is it that masculinities uh, play out right within and beyond ideas of machismo? How is it that queer Latino uh, men, you know, both navigate context, but also resist um, and engage in agentic actions within context? And again, where is it that our trans community are highlighted or not highlighted within our realities um, in higher education? So a lot of this work actually started out um, alongside a dear mentor of mine, Dr. David Perez II, who was doing work on high achieving Latino men in higher education. Um, and in conjunction, we decided to undergo an investigation of how queer Latino men specifically navigate sexuality um, and navigate issues of family while they're enrolled in, in higher ed. And so what we found was that so often family really served a kind of dualistic role in their lives where they could be seen both as a support network, which we oftentimes know of Latinx AO students that family can become a, a major influence in their educational trajectories, but that they could also be seen as a form of and a source of insecurity um, and this was because, you know, a number of queer Latino men shared this fear of not being accepted or being seen as less than based on cultural norms that they had seen in their Latinx culture. And yet, as I mentioned, because my scholarship oftentimes looks at how context shapes students' realities, but also how students push against these oppressive realities. Um, we also investigated how is it that queer Latino men um, redefine the concept of family. And what we found was that, you know, in the absence perhaps of support from their biological family or their family of origin, that they actually created chosen familia um, in college, uh, whether it was creating peer networks or creating strong relationships with faculty and staff that served as a form of, you know, parental guidance. And so some of the stories that we um, were able to, to listen to and hear um, what were stories like that of Angel, who talked about um, the relationship with his father um, and how his father would say things like, you have this personality and you're very manly. Uh, and Angel goes back and says, you know, dad, I, I know that you know that I'm gay. You put that aside, but you need to bring it back to the circle. And so ways that students are experiencing a decentering of their sexuality um, within their family dynamics. Uh, and the ways that that happens right here, we see in this example of Angel that um, his dad is trying to assert his masculinity 
because of this fear of being seen as less masculine because of the sexuality. But angels here asserting, no, I want my sexuality be, to be present. I want it to be centered. Um, and so certainly how individuals like Angel push back against the decentering of their identities. And I appreciate the comment in the chat function of, yes, that we're seeing a number more of Phoenix AO students feeling comfortable and sharing out their sexualities, whether it's queerness, bisexuality, or other sexual identities. Similarly, we have uh, people like Carlos who, you know, talked about why he didn't necessarily share his identity with his family. Um, and in particular, you know, he wanted to push it off because he knew that he wanted to invest. Um, he, he, he knew he didn't necessarily have the time to, to invest in educating them um, because of the stereotypes and the, you know, myths associated with sexuality in these spaces. And so I share Carlos's story specifically because um, I also don't want to necessarily further the idea that coming out is the goal. In fact, many of our queer and trans Latinx AO students may not choose to come out for a number of reasons, whether it is not wanting to educate their families, whether it's being financially reliant of upon family, um, and I want to name that just because people don't disclose their sexuality doesn't mean that they're not fully actualized queer people. Because they may in fact find support systems on their campuses, like Andrew's story, which he talked about being involved with a queer person of color organization on, on campus. Um, and Andrew was one who didn't necessarily have support from his family back home but here on campus was able to create a family of people through this queer person of color organization. And so again, even when biological family isn't present, how is it that these students are still forming chosen family networks? So as a little bit of context, I, I started off with this particular line of research looking at I, I, identity um, and the individuals of experience, uh, individuals experiences within college. But more recently, I've actually started to expand my um, research into not just thinking about what are the experiences of students, but rather what are institutions doing on a broader level in order to serve queer and trans Latinx people. And in particular, I've been um, starting this research specifically at HSIs, Hispanic serving institutions. And that is because in recent years, we've seen an increase of people say, saying that we could focus on how HSIs are serving at the Inexio populations. And yet for me, my question is, you know, even in these discussions of serving this, in what ways are queer and trans people oftentimes left out of these conversations? And in what ways does white supremacy actually intersect with other forms of marginalization? And so thankfully, we're starting to see this recognition of how compounding systems of power shape our structures for serving. Um, there's been emerging research on LGBTQ plus communities at HSIs, um, including um, some studies that I've been a part of. And, for, and I argue that it's important to be doing this work at HSIs because some of the dynamics that may occur um, and may have been seen with family networks uh, that I just named with partisan experiences may be happening on a broader school level. Um, and in particular here, I share a quote from a participant on my studies who actually draws comparisons between their experiences with family and what they've encountered at their HSI, um, where the participant named, you know, all of my friends are like Hispanic or Latino and queer, and it's like your family is okay with it, but you just don't ever talk about it. Um, and at this school, you often don't acknowledge it because it's not relevant to your studies, so we don't talk about it. And similarly, uh, people have made other participants in this pilot study named that even if it does get acknowledged when it comes to sexuality, usually it's a safe narrative. It's gay, lesbian people, but not trans people. And so we're seeing all of these different narratives of people who identify as queer and trans within H and HSI, sensing as if that their holistic selves are not to be attended to not being served. Um, so even though schools may be doing a better job of thinking about Latinx AO identity broadly, that they may not necessarily be intervening when it comes to the 
wide diversity of Latinx AO communities. And for that reason, I argue that we need to be doing a lot better job in, in thinking about the wide diversity of our Latinx AO communities, whether it's in diversity plans, whether it's thinking about, you know, how do we recruit faculty and staff who take a complex approach to serving Latinx AO communities. Um, of course, we can't necessarily put a call out specifically only for queer and trans Latinx AO faculty, but are we recruiting faculty and staff who are doing work um, and whose agendas are all around queer and trans Latinx AO people? The same goes for our pedagogy, our classes, our programs and services. Do we have work that is approaching the intersections between queer and trans studies and Latinx Chicanx studies? Do we uh, do specific programming for our queer and trans um, students um, who identify as part of the Latinx AO community? So on the slide, I show the example of San Jose State, um, an HSI who has a specific organization called Nuestra Gente that is for queer Latinx people. And so, again, how do we carve out spaces and do this work in order to support those who are multiply marginalized? And the last note that I that I wanted to end with is that going back to that participant quote that I shared before around the experiences um, of, of people I've seen like HSIs push forward a safe narrative where they may focus on sexual minorities, but they may not actually focus on trans communities. I think this is a major question and a major oversight of our educational system so far. What are the experiences of our trans students who are navigating HSIs, especially as they may be negotiating their gender expression, their gender identity, gender norms within um, the institution? And so in the same ways that we oftentimes overlook trans communities within our Latinx AO groups broadly, I think the same thing is happening within our HSIs. Um, and, and this comes forward in a number of different ways, whether it is not necessarily having resources or services for trans people, not having trans affirming health care um, uh, policies at our HSIs, um, or it is having organizations for queer people um, on the basis of sexuality, but not necessarily gender, right? And so um, this is a call for all of us who are working with lovely big sale communities to be asking, where are our trans students? Um, and in what ways do we oftentimes default to the majority within our minoritized communities? In what ways do we default to cisgender, straight, Latinx AO people when we're thinking about belongingness? Um, so I think this is a really nice connection between the presentations in this particular session as we seek to complicate belongingness, um, especially for our Latinx AO people. And so with that, um, I do want to leave some time here. Uh, and I do put up, I'm putting up my email address. So if there's anything in particular that was sparked for you throughout the presentation, always happy to talk more. Um, but I do believe we have about seven minutes or so for questions. So happy to take any questions that people may have. Question, this is Kelly Searsmith again. Um, uh, I wondered about faith. Um, particularly Catholic faith, and how this plays. I know it has a big impact on the family. Sometimes in the U.S., we talk about and uh, sometimes point to polls or research about uh, the growing Hispanic population in the United States, we say, is largely Catholic, somewhat conservative. Um, how does this affect the journey of uh, Latino college students? How, and especially not only in dealing with the family issues around their queerness, but also the way that they practice their faith or don't practice their faith as they develop uh, during their college years? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, so what I will name is that, yes, faith is oftentimes a central influence. Not always, right? Um, you know, but but with the students that I've talked to and the students that I've done research alongside, um, faith does typically come up to the forefront as, you know, here is a way that I was socialized to think about, you know, um, issues of sexuality and gender as connected to my faith tradition. And so for many, college becomes an opportunity to explore 
make meaning and perhaps a learn some of those unlearn some of those messages. Um, and so faith is certainly a central influence that people do contend with. For some students, that means moving away from a faith tradition. But also I've known many queer, queer and trans Latinx AO people who find a new relationship to faith, one that is perhaps much more inclusive in that web that they um, experience. And so what I would argue for those who are creating services and resources for queer and trans Latinx people is that we should have that in the back of our mind as we're programming, right? So if we have a queer and trans Latinx student organization, in what ways are we giving them the tools to think about the relationship with religion, with faith, with spirituality, in ways that might be more empowering than the, what they've experienced thus far. But what I do find is that college oftentimes becomes that point, that critical juncture point that where people are able to now ask questions, push back, unlearn. Um, so certainly faith is a major kind of contributor to I think these dynamics. Wonderful question. Other questions that are on people's minds. Kelly, you got another one? Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking about recently on our campus, we had a dad's weekend, you know, and there are a lot of events throughout the year where uh, we will bring parents and families onto campus uh, to celebrate student life and make connections and the students can show them what their life is like on campus. And I was wondering for queer uh, Latino students, is that kind of programming uh, vexing, welcoming? I mean, yeah. how do we support them in that? Uh, when that is happening, if they want to bring their families, because you've been talking about how campus can be kind of an alternative space for expression, yeah. for alternative family-like networks among friends. Talk, talk to us about how we can support students through that. Yeah, that's another excellent question. You know, I, I do have a number of folks who have worked in parent and family programs. And what we know about, you know, queer and trans people broadly, not even just thinking about the intersections between queerness, transness, and Latinx identity, is that queer and trans people may have fraught relationships with their, bio, their biological family. Uh, may, once again, I've never tried to paint any group as, uh, as monolithic, but um, may have fraught relationships with the family. And so things like family weekends can be a particularly complex moment, you know, so for me, I would think about a number of strategies that we could use in order to, to negotiate that. So one may actually be hosting spaces through, during a family weekend uh, for people whose relationship with family is complicated um, or non-existent, right? Um, and so have, making sure that they have support healing services, healing spaces, um, especially as they may be seeing other people around engaging with the family in which their relationship may not be as strong or present. The other thing that I would um, name is that in what ways, I, I don't think we in higher ed do enough job, do a good enough job in thinking about chosen family networks. Um, so I mentioned that these students that I've spoken with have created chosen family networks in college, but other people, but they've also created chosen family networks in communities back home, right? So they may have friends that they consider family, right? And so can we expand our definitions of family for things like family weekends or family events to also include chosen family? And in what ways do we have conversations with our campus communities around, you know, family can take a look a number of different ways um, because it's true, I think, with queer and trans people, um, this idea of chosen family or what some may call the kinship networks is much more present. And so do we, how do we honor the realities of those students in our campuses, I think is, is an important question that we should be continuing with. Um, and yeah, just not believing it doesn't exist. And so I think that's an excellent question to get us thinking about how is it that something that we've thought about for so long, family in higher ed, how did those kind of connect for people who may not really have that? biological family connection. Thank you, Kelly. Such a good question. 
But um, again, I'll put my email in the uh, chat function. I'm happy to continue um, conversations with anyone. But I want to be mindful that I think that at this point we were moving on to an exercise. Thank you again so much, Dr. Duenas, Dr. Duran, for the amazing presentations. Again, reminding everybody um, of how dynamic and diverse the Latinx um, Latinx Latino Latina um, population is. So with that, now we are on track for our activity, which I will be uh, leading. So for those of y'all in this room, and I think that they'll be sending anybody who's in um, room three will be coming over to um, room either room one or room, room two. So we'll have some people um, popping in and joining the crew. Um, but let me just briefly describe what we'll be doing um, during the activity. So as mentioned earlier on uh, during the symposium, we're really trying to not only share knowledge around sense of belonging among Latinx populations, but we also want to do something about it, right? We have this applied component at the symposium. And part of the reason why is um, maybe you've experienced this or your students have um, told you about this. Oftentimes there are lots of meetings and lots of planning sessions and lots of um, reports and recommendations created to create change and then it kind of stops there. Or there are symposiums like this one um, that, that really wanna uh, get that movement going and then it kind of stops there. So um, for this next, these new next few minutes, we actually wanted to, because we're all in the same room together, really take advantage of this moment and create some kind of action plan for the university system. So this could be, um, think about um, ways in which we can foster sense of belonging among Latinx students at your specific institution. Um, or system-wide. So um, the University of Illinois system includes the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, University of Illinois Springfield, and University of Illinois uh, Chicago. And so um, we would really love to create some kind of action plan or different activities, different things that the university can do to, to support um, and retain Latinx students. So I'm gonna be taking notes um, as you speak so that I can, um, so breakout room one is doing this and we're doing this in this breakout room. And what we're eventually going to do is um, the IMS team and I will come together and make a report out of this um, that we will share with important policymakers and um, important people up high um, in the university system and hopefully start creating some of this change that we that we would like. Um, so this I'll, I'll open it up with this question and and we'll just have a conversation around it. Um, if you are a student, faculty, staff uh, and identify as Latinx, what are some things, what are some ways in which the university can strengthen your sense of belonging or strengthen your experience um, as a student, faculty, and staff. So you can drop things in the chat, you can say things out loud, and, and I'll be taking notes. All right, we have something in the chat already. So as an Afro-Latino student, how do you intersect Black and Brown students and provide networks of support to them across campus to give them a sense of belonging, specifically at PWI? Right, so for example, UIUC is um, a PWI, while UI Chicago, I believe, is classified as an HSI. So we have lots of really interesting context to, to think about. So what do y'all think? How do we provide, or how can we provide networks of support specifically um, for Afro-Latino students um, and possibly across campus? What do we think? Uh, I have talked to fellow students um, who kind of fall between uh, racial or ethnic categories for our cultural houses here on campus because, uh, you know, 
is focused cultural house. We have an African-American cultural house and students who are Afro-Latino sometimes feel like they're not welcome in each of those spaces. So I think in within each of these cultural houses, there needs to be an awareness of this concern and, um, you know, then and programming and outreach and support, you know, actively inviting, actively having conversations uh, about broader inclusion of these um, communities, maybe combined events, you know, um, arts and speakers and all of those things around it. And, you know, I think also one of the concerns that people on campuses have is then do we create a cultural house for every spectrum of possible uh, racial or cultural identification, ethnic identification, because, um, you know, these support communities of like kind, uh, you know, of, of mutual identification are so important to that sense of belonging. So that's one of the things I know has been discussed online in different communities about how far do we take this and are, are there alternatives to creating the house situation. But we do have these structures of the cultural houses, which I think are so positive and important. And I wonder if there are specific ways that their programming can be expanded, their sense of welcome can be expanded. But I don't think it should stop there. And I'm curious to hear what others think about uh, other alternative solutions to the cultural house piece. Buenos dias, everyone. My name is Mariana. I use pronouns she, her, hers, ella. Um, I appreciate, Rita, your question. And I think um, I'm always shocked when I attend um, seminars like these, the disconnect between sometimes faculty research and even practitioners on the ground um, and or lack of knowledge of what's going on. Um, for example, that is extremely important what Rita brought up. And a lot of people don't know, but the past two years, well, historically, our BNAC and La Casa have an early arrival program for students, for first year students. Um, and this early arrival program catered towards the student sense of belonging. They're brought in a week before classes start. Um, BNAC hosts circuit, La Casa hosts Conectate. And as of two years ago, there's actually cross programming called C Squared, where we bring in the students and we really talk about empowerment, solidarity. They learn the shared history, right? Because our cultural centers exist because of activism and, and student activism. And, um, you know, for us, we get a lot of feedback from students that our Afro-Latino students didn't have to pick a program. They learned that if they're part of this early arrival program, they can actually develop their, they can develop their two identities. Um, so I think that as, as we think about what our students need on this campus as we think about intersectionality, I think we should also think about what are the current resources U of I has in our system schools and are we pouring funds and resources into those spaces so the work can continue to be done and to be strengthened. Yeah, great points, Mariana. What was the um, cross-cultural center program called? It's called C squared. So C -squared, it's um, okay. just a collaborative between Circuit, which is BNAC's early arrival program for first year students and Conectate La Casas. And just for some history context, Circuit and uh, C Square, or Circuit and Conectate have been around for over eight plus years. And it is an identity-based place um, to really hit on all the transitional things a first year student is going through and also a first year uh, transfer student as well. And just to pay be piggyback a little bit about what Kelly was saying in regards to family visit days and dad's weekends. Um, you know, La Casa actually has a Latino family visit day event that goes on the same weekend as dad's weekend. It's been going around for 19, 19 years. Um, and this is a place where students, right, they may not have a dad and our students, our Latina students, they they have extended family. Sometimes they don't have family. Sometimes their family is their best friend. And so this uh, family weekend actually just caters towards that, that non-traditional uh, family structure of our students. That's awesome. Uh, thank you, Mariana. So it looks like there are already some systems in place. So maybe part of this action plan is to keep those funded. Um, money is very important for maintaining a lot of these programs. So I'm writing down, keep them funded. 
or fund them more. <laughs> And while it's not its own cultural center, it is, uh, I think, an excellent collaboration between the two. Um, so that's amazing. Yeah. Um, something uh -huh. something Go ahead. to keep in mind as well is this, um, this Victor said about this with MEP, Granger College of Engineering, uh, is this the, the program that also happens across campus, right? Because different departments may also have similar programming. I know that there's like the RISE program some of these summer uh, activities um, in order to be able to collaborate and amplify the work that we're doing. So I know that, for example, whenever we do our early movement program called Embark, we make sure to end early enough so that our students can also choose to participate in both Conectate and um, Circuit. So those are type of things where communication has been really helpful amongst the different organizations on campus to be able to to be able to be best supportive for students. Yeah, you bring up a great point around communication, especially at large institutions. Uh, do you feel like that communication, um, like facilitating that com communication has been easy or are there ways that the institution can better ensure that all the different programs kind of know when they are and connect and make sure that they're, that they're not overlapping? It'd be wonderful to have something to have it be more institutionalized. I think as we go right now, the collaboration happens because the people involved in organizing this have a concerted effort to do that. There's a mindfulness and purposefulness of being able to connect with different people to make sure that, again, we're supporting students. So if we would be able to institutionalize this in some way um, without losing any of the autonomy that each of the programs have, because that is something that can happen as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just looking through the comments. Hi, I'd like to say something. Liz Ramirez, she, her pronouns from Las Ganas at UIC. Um, I'm kind of taking everything that everyone else is saying. And I think one of the things that at Las Ganas as a um, federally funded program we're going through is kind of validating our needs and constantly having to fight for funding. So kind of what Victor was saying. Um, and so, you know, I really, if, if you're going up there, I would really like to advocate for our program that is meeting, you know, helping students find a sense of belonging as STEM students at UIC at a minority serving institution. We have the data that shows that we work, but we're constantly fighting for funding and being institutionalized. And so, um, you know, I think we, we have some people here that know our work and, you know, we'd love to, to be able to share our student stories and our data to show the effectiveness. Of, you know, we're having this great meeting right now and I'm like we can prove that we do that and so how how can we get that message across to them we believe it right and so how how do we do that and i'm happy to collaborate and work with people to make this happen um but i just i just want to put it out there thank you everyone yes thank you elizabeth um so you bring up a good point too of like there's there's there are, there can be amazing things happening um but then you're still fighting for funding or you're um they want some kind of maybe evidence-based uh, research or report of what you're doing, which can be hard to obtain, especially if you don't have like the separate research funding to to evaluate uh, programs. So my maybe something act, like I'm thinking of something actionable that can be done, perhaps providing um one making it so that you don't have to fight your case every time you want some funding that would be the path of least resistance um but if they did need um some kind of more evidence or um more translating what's actually going on um i i'm thinking of um what came up to my head is CREA, so uh culturally relevant evaluation and assessment and that's part of, of uiuc but perhaps using their expertise, um, they evaluate programs in a culturally relevant and sustaining way. And so um, do you think that that is something that I should write down or, or maybe not, um, which would be finding ways to assist these uh, programs, organizations and um, centers in, in providing that evidence 
that it is working and that you should keep funding it. Yeah, I think that would be really helpful. And also, I think maybe more transparency in that middle ground, right? We, so because we are grant funded, we do have data and we um, to support it, but it's almost like there's kind of a, I, I see it kind of like as a cloud in the middle that we're not connecting the top from, you know, practitioners from leadership and how do that we get them to see, like, I need their exact questions so I can give them the exact answers so that we're all both on the same page, if that makes sense. And I, I don't often see that we're all at the same page all the time. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so good. Along, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Along those same lines, I think that we there is a big opportunity to be able to do more of the connection from the academic side and from us that are on the practitioner side of things, right? Because there's, uh, we, I'll speak for our program, we do a lot of good work that intuitively I know is working, but if we could have framework that someone else could come in and evaluate for that has expertise in that, then we'd be able to have some of these other data points that we, we would also be able to disseminate. Right, to be able to do that, because so often I hear about people or because uh, at bigger institutions don't have the siloing effect. And then you hear about things happening in different places. And then uh, sometimes you wish you would have been able to be brought into the conversation to be able to execute it a little bit more effectively because the people who are organizing it have a certain skill set. But yet the people who are putting it together and have to execute it have a different skill set. Right. Mm -hmm. So having more communication happen would be wonderful. The other thing about that, though, is that that also requires funding in terms of increasing the number of staff that are going to be able to do this as well. Mm -hmm. Or maybe finding some way, um, I'm sure it exists, but maybe finding some way to uh, maybe the institutions can provide grant funding for collaborations between like the centers and the academics. They can come together and and um, help disseminate like good practices or something like that. Does that sound Absolutely. along the lines? Okay. Absolutely. And then Elizabeth, you mentioned like getting, getting the, the 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 people who are the staff that are running the centers, and the 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 people who are giving the money, so the people up on top, the presidents and the provosts and all that, making sure they're all on the same page, right? Over here, and there was all. Oh, go ahead. Did someone unmute? I did. This is Angelica Alfaro. I'm with the U of I System Government Relations. Um, I think that the next layer after you we get all of that, what everyone said together, is a sense of um, the next layer would be advocacy, right? Um, to U of I System leadership, to our government relations office, to our in this case, the Latino caucus at the city and at the state. Um, but before that, there's a, a level of understanding that needs to take place and for them to fully understand what the programs are doing and the fact that they are working. I know that was mentioned before. I wanted to kind of live in the space of what Liz said, the fact that you are constantly having to advocate for funding. I mean, it's 2022. And back to what um, in the former presentation, I'm, <laughs> I was hesitant to speak since I'm speaking later and I didn't want to take away from something that I, so you may hear it again, but um, one of the quotes that was used um, in Duena's presentation was Marco, if they want the idea of you, but they don't actually want you at the table, um, that that's just, that's another piece that um, speaks to everything and kind of ties everything together. Um, the fact that you have to continuously, um, it's kind of gas litty, as I call it, <laughs> uh, to have to constantly have to prove um, ourselves um, when you already have amazing programs that are working and constantly asking for funding for Bridge, for example. And we are advocating at the system level for that. Um, so I'll share during my talk about some initiatives that relate to this, but I, I just wanted to add that there's that other component of it um, in educating leadership, um, having them understand the programming, but really wanted to sit in that space of the fact that we have to continuously have to do that. And I'm just shouting out all of y'all for the work that you do. 
Thank you. Um, um, so one of the common, uh, a common theme that's coming up, I think, for us at this during this time is why do we have to fight for funding? So I have I have no idea about how any of that works since I'm just a little researcher off in a corner. Um, but it seems like fighting for funding means that it's not already set, that it's not um, that it's not part of the standard budget. Like you always have to kind of explain or try for things versus there might be some programs where it's part of the budget, it's automatic. And so um, if there is someone fighting in any way or having to explain something, it's, it's fighting or explaining why it should be decreased. Um, the, is that kind of how it's going? And if so, um, what are some ways that we can maybe, I, maybe one of the solutions is make a standard budget item where these centers get funded or these policies and programs get funding so that you're not fighting every time to get the funding and instead it's kind of set. But I could be wrong. <laughs> I could be totally wrong on this one. Um, it depends on the program, right? Uh, sometimes it comes from, the money's coming from the system and to each university, and then the university decides how they're going mm -hmm. about that. Some of the okay. programs like the Hispanic Center of Excellence, it's a line item. There's been conversations about actually um, making that part of the budget so that, you know, um, you're not fighting every year, not knowing if it's going to be increased or decrease. Um, in reality, sometimes, you know, you're, you're just excited you didn't get decreased and we're cheering on crumbs, basically. Um, and, and I think that that's part. There might be some solutions there. There's been conversations um, recently about that. And, you know, there's the chief financial officer and they can, you know, at the leadership level, figure out what makes the most sense. Um, but I think the fact that you're writing this down and it's gonna be cold in a formal way to the university leadership. I think it's really important. They need to get it from all, all the angles. Thanks, yeah. Um, Jennifer also talked about um, institutional investment in development, programming and development for Latinx faculty and staff community to build their networks. Um, and I think that's great too, if anybody wants to expand on that. Um, providing some programming for, you know, we do stuff for the students, but then when Latinx faculty and staff enter the institution, how are they supported? How, how do they find each other? How do they build their, their sense of community? I can add that in as well. Um, I'm look. I'm reading um, in this comment. Sounds like you need more Latinx faculty. Got it. <laughs> yeah, it needs to catch up with the Latinx student body. Okay, so creating pipelines for hiring Latinx faculty. Awesome, I will write that down. I'll just, um, this is Angelica again. Um, I think there's layers to that, even if the pipeline is there and it looks good on paper. I think I would <laughs> add a sub bullet to, to just ensuring that we're really, even just promoting a job uh, position. I think so, what I've realized in my time here, if they send it to me and I can share it with a couple of people in my network, HR checks the box and then they keep it moving. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm, just, I'm just encouraging us to just dig a little deeper there um, mm -hmm. and push HR a little bit um, further on how do we truly get, at the minimum, really get the word out to diversify the candidates, period. Yeah, I just read an article about um, how a lot of efforts to um, hire faculty of color, they start off great and they recruit, they recruit applicants in, you know, the, they're very successful and then it stops there and for various reasons um, throughout the application process. So yeah, being more intentional about, it's not just about getting the word out, 
um, but also how are we making sure that our hiring practices are culturally relevant and that they're mindful of all of these systemic barriers. Yeah. Ooh, Bernie said there's the bridge to faculty program. Okay. Keep that one funded. Yeah, I'll just mention just briefly, um, we basically have support from the chat. We're in our third cohort this year. So we just took our first team that, that were recruited two years ago um, to be um, postdocs. It's a national, so what we do is we have a national search for a position for postdoctoral post post positions. Um, the title varies a little bit in HR depending on what the department is, but um, this in principle, we bring them in for two years. Um, they have very specific duties. Um, they get paid out of the program um, and the idea is for them to actually move into a junior level tenure track faculty position in departments. So departments have to actually compete for that slot to be able to hire that postdoc. And then from that point, um, then they have somebody that will transition to a junior position. And the important part is basically the competition process. Has the department really thought about how they're going to mentor that postdoctoral scholar to be a junior faculty member that's going to move toward promotion? Um, and secondly, to continue with these mentoring teams, um, which we help train to really think about um, what uh, really they're collaborative so that they really engage with the postdoc to get them into um, getting a lab set up to be able to write papers. Either they're going to maybe finish their, um, their um, earlier research and write that up or else they're going to start new projects and be collaborative, but to really make them be successful as junior faculty members right from the very start and mentor them through. So the departments really have to be strategic in terms of thinking about how they're going to support these students and that works that works well we basically took 10 in the first year we took 20 in the second year um and so it's really changed um the line in terms of us being able to recruit um faculty of color and 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 also in some areas women um that may be in areas actually nursing would be separate we mean more men in nursing for example that would be an example too where we, we look for those places where certainly there are um, marginalized um, individuals that we want to move into faculty positions. That's amazing. Yeah. Keeping that one funded, definitely. Uh, this is Elvira. I, I guess that's great. That's wonderful. But also another piece that I have witnessed, you know, throughout the years here in Illinois is the, the mentorship that um, faculty need. So it's heartbreaking to see assistant professors that don't get tenure. We fail, we fail them because we are not providing an, a structure program to mentor them throughout those five hard years as an assistant professor. So it's important to organize teams of um, more senior professors that will be constantly mentoring them. Uh, we have a program called the uh, Research Academy in ACES in UIUC that mentors new, new professors every year, 10, 12, 16, whatever new professors are in the whole college, uh, have an, a structured program called Reser Academy where they get um, uh, grant writing, paper writing, uh, mentoring grad students. How is the culture in Illinois? Just, just learning the culture in Illinois and heads of department come to talk to them you um, well, different different uh, leaders of the university come to talk to them, so so they really feel at home really fast, and they know where to go for support. So I think that should be really an important item to develop if if colleges are not doing it uh, to really support hard to retain those underrepresented professors because as I said, then we lose them after five six years, they are gone. So that's not the way we should go. So, yeah, thank you. What was the name of the um, of the mentor program in ACES? It's called Reser Academy. It's paid by the college 
uh, facilitates the professors to get training on grant writing. So there is a specialized group, outside group. It's expensive, but it's very, very worth it to hire that program and teach them. Teach Nobody teaches you how to write a successful grant. Uh, it's very rare when our professor really know how to write an NIH, NSF, USDA, foundation, whatever. So we need to invest in training our young faculty, early career faculty to know how to write grants and then to bring them to Washington DC or wherever the uh, governmental or foundation is to, to talk to them, you know, on a one-to-one -one basis and facilitate their training in that way. So see, you sit down with an NIH uh, program director and talk to them about your research and please give me feedback, give me ideas. So it's a, it's a one semester, well, almost two semesters, spring and summer uh, invested in that training program. I think it's crucial for all early career professors, but mainly for underrepresented groups faculty. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you. And Bernie, you had a, it looks like the, the bridge to faculty program does that mentoring piece. So extending that over to those that come in as, as tenure track faculty might be nice. Yeah, you had something? Yeah, so I just, uh, our, the mentoring from the department extends all the way into their junior faculty member, they continue with that mentoring team. So we don't just drop them them, it goes all the way towards mentoring them for promotion. Um, the, other, the other program we have is something called PIF, which is Pipeline to Faculty. It's for grad students moving into being postdocs. So again, if they want to move to academic careers, we have a way that will help fund them. All of these programs also aren't just mentoring from the department. We actually, again, meet with the scholars um, weekly or monthly with and tell them about what resources are on campus. So we'll talk about, we'll bring them in like the vice chancellor of a research's office. We'll talk about how you, how do you submit a grant proposal? What's the process? What grant research is um, available? What fellowships are available? Um, all of those kind of processes, you know, how you set up your lab. Uh, we help connect them. Let's say they're doing a certain type of research. They need to find somebody on campus to do work with animals or something. So we connect them with those types of resources as well. So they're not kind of trying to do it all on their own um, or somebody in their department. They may be doing something that somebody in their department doesn't know how to offer advice. So we're we work with out of the office of diversity, but we also work with departments to provide um, those give them all the information they need. So by the time they're actually junior faculty members, they know a lot about UIC. They know what they need to do to be able to write proposals, what they need to do um, in terms of getting grant support and so on. Um, so that's a big part of it is, is, is continuing that mentoring um, rather than just dropping them when they're hired. So as bridge to faculty, you can look that up on the UIC website. Got it. I'm learning a lot from these other institutions in the system. We're going to bring some of these things over to U of I, U, UIUC. Um, and a lot of the things y'all mentioned also go with Christopher's point in the chat about, um, I think a lot of times we talk about opening the door, um, providing that opportunity and access. But now I feel like a lot of us are talking about what's that next step? So retention, keeping students and faculty at the institution. Um, graduating them, moving them forward. Um, so it's we're talking, I feel like this group today, we're talking beyond getting them through the door, but actually supporting them the whole time that they are at the institution. Any other ideas? We have some around, some things I highlighted are uh, mentorship for faculty in, in various ways and um, then I have um, you know maintaining or providing finding ways to maintain funding for um, not only the cultural centers but what the centers are doing such as um, C squared and circuit and Conectate. Um, there was another center at UIC I think Elizabeth you were a part of it was it called Ghana something I'll find it. Yeah, Ganas is extraordinary. <laughs> and, and Dr. Santarciego, Santarciero is the, the leader there. That's Ganas, got it, thank you. 
Any other ideas? Saying, Nidia Di Selvira, I, I, I think we have extraordinary examples in our three universities. Uh, identify them, value them, support them more, enhance their, facilitate their work, <laughs> not interfere, but facilitate their work, provide more funding, of course, but learn from each other. Like um, University of Illinois Chicago is already a Hispanic serving institutions with other potential funding from external sources. Uh, we don't have that in Urbana Champaign. We don't have that in Springfield yet. So we have to learn from each other. Is there, is working. So I was telling <laughs> Dr. Bernie, we need to clone him and clone his programs, you know? We don't have to start from zero. If these have shown, um, success <laughs> so so we just need to team up work together and implement what is already working we are sisters right sisters un sister university so yeah i love that um and that's also something that i felt um coming in here it's been hard to grasp a, a sense like when i have a research idea or a program idea it's hard to get a sense of what is already out there um and especially across uh across institutions. So are there any ways, if I were to go to the president now and say like, we really need to centralize all the great things that are happening across campus. And then he turns around and he says, cool, I'll do that. Tell me how, what, what, what should I tell the president? What are some ways that y'all think we can centralize and really um, bring together all the great things that are happening across campuses so that we can support each other and share resources? Yeah. Hi, Nidia. Uh, this is Beto Escobar from UAUC of the Minority Hi, Students. Beto. Yes. Hi. <laughs> yes. Um, you, you mentioned something before about grants and maybe a group of faculty or a combination of faculty and staff to write a proposal to the administration here at the university. And I believe those grants are already available through the Office of the Provost or to the uh, Office of um, inclusion here at the university but what i'm thinking is if, if such a thing can happen is really to 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 do the research of, of of all of the good things that we've talked about today that are going on campus with the primary objective of impressing this funding that keep coming in this conversation so that that for, for what you say you know how do i go to the president well you, you you, you could go with with that research that that group uh, can come up with with a funding also sponsored by by the administrations and um yeah so that's my thinking that's a great idea so maybe coming together and saying um here's our grant proposal we're going to to go out to the three to the three institutions and find out what are these great programs and and find some way of um putting them all together via either a report or on a website so that someone can go somewhere and very quickly find all the great things that are happening is that the did, did i catch that correctly yes and and this all the things need funding <laughs> yes <laughs> highlight that yes Elizabeth, yeah, or um, yeah, maybe that grant can also include, or we can have another kind of arm where we have workshops, yeah, showcase highlighting the different programs. Mm -hmm. We're all in this room together. It's a it's a Thursday in, in that part of the semester, right before everyone's trying to get to fall break. Um, so I really appreciate everyone spending the time to think through this with me, um, and. I'm, I'm almost hesitant to let y'all go to the next thing because I want to keep y'all together. We have such great ideas. Um, I, I wrote all of these down, um, but also we have, I think um, IMAS has a, a running list. If you want to be part of IMAS, you can put your name on there and maybe we can find ways to share our work. Um, oh, Rita said, uh, similar to International Week, maybe we can have, we can host a Latino Latina Week and we can showcase everybody's work across campuses. That would be great, yeah. Uh, but please talk to each other. So we have, you know, all of these attendees here, maybe um, I'm asked, we can maybe figure out a way to, to keep you all connected. Um, 
in many ways because we got people from all three institutions and others. So. Thank you for joining uh, this session. So the title of this presentation, my presentation is around my, this uh, second strand of my research is a uh, title is Compañerismo as a Sense of Belonging, Latino Graduate Students Navigating the Uncharted Waters. So when thinking about uncharted waters is as first generation Latino men, uh, uh, getting to the doctoral program is uncharted waters, right? We don't know the waters that could be, they could show that there's no danger ahead, but we know underneath there, there might be some sharks, right? And stuff. So kind of this, try to imagine kind of this un, like uncharted waters, this image of thinking that we, as first generation Latino men, we don't know what's out there, right? And we're navigating the space un, of unknown, right? And so the reason uh, for the focus is the, the significance of, you know, um, the Latinos, Latina Latinos have um, risen in, in receiving the doctorate. So we see the rise, uh, uh, you know, this looking at it from an asset-based approach, right? Not from a deficit, but you see here uh, more Latina Latinos are, are actually enrolling and in, 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 getting access to doc, doctor degrees. So it's important for us to take a look and examine graduate students, right, uh, uh, Latina, Latinos. So just to highlight, what I'll be presenting is about based on a focus group with three Latino men, right, who were um, attending a predominantly white institution, um, and they were getting their doctoral degree. And looking at this context, as you can see here, uh, particularly, they were all in the College of Education. And so here you see the numbers, you can uh, kind of imagine this idea like it can be difficult to kind of have a sense of belonging in the in this kind of context that they were on and and so looking at this is the institution that they were at and so but the uniqueness about um the what i'll be presenting is, is about how these three latino men came together and we know research highlights that peer network support is very important and especially for students of color but in particularly, there's not a lot of research that looks at, uh, at cultural bonds that go beyond peer networks, right? And so what I'll be presenting is this idea of compañerismo that goes beyond just simple peer networks and more like a phenomena of brotherhood, of a bond. And, and this bond created to help them navigate this unknown space. So um, we created this model. So this is the model of compañerismo. So you see on the left-hand side in the box is this, uh, this idea of uncharted waters, right? And so on the, on the, on the left-hand side, you see these beginning factors that supported this development of compañerismo. So we have the institutional role and support, which is the recruitment, the specific recruitment of Latina Latinos, right? Providing funding, as we know, funding is important. And also the institution provided spaces, right? Uh, particularly students of color office spaces, right? And then also the hiring and sustaining of faculty of color, for, for these students, right? So that was one factor that helped this development of compañerismo. Another factor was the cultural affinity that the Latino men had. So that this included their racial ethnic identity, their gender, right? Their culture, their language. They, they, they interchangeably use Spanish and English, right? And so kind of that's another factor that supported this idea of compañerismo. And also we argue that all these three men, by, by them achieving and getting into a doc program, they, they themselves are coming in with some form of resilience in them, right? So they have this adaptive factor that helps them kind of coming in with resilience. But what we're going to argue, what I'll show is that their compañerismo, the bond that they developed, actually grew stronger and supported their resilience. So when these three men first started the program, they had they, they developed what, what the literature would say is peer network support. So they had a friendship, right? So they, they kind of started spending a little bit of time together, had it some, they started attending some classes and they started recognizing and come together based on this identity, like these shared identities, right? And when we take, for, for this group particularly, uh, thinking about, uh, 
like the, the intersection of, of ethnicity and gender, right? And so after spending, by the third year that these participants were in the doctoral program, we, they started to recognize that they had this bond, right? And so what we call compañerismo. So basically compañerismo is an adaptive tool for personal and academic success. So as you can see, it's not just about academics, right? This compañerismo is also about that sense of belonging, that, that self, right? And so it also strengthens their already um, identity, of, they're, they're already a uh, protective factor of resilience. But also, it also, this compañerismo protect against issues of isolation and microaggression, like these racialized incidents that happen as they, you know, as they go navigate a doctoral program. So basically, as you can see, we argue that based on these initial factors, based on their being placed and, and, to, and, and being in the same context, these three of the men developed a bond cultural uh, acompañarismo. And as a result of acompañarismo, it was a successful navigation of the doctoral program. So these individuals talked about how they collaborated, right? They um, attended conferences, uh, did research together, and they also supported each other um, through writing and coursework and progress. And at the time of our study, two of the three participants actually graduated from the program. So this is our model, our conception model. And what I wanna just do now is just kind of highlight this um, definition, this working definition that we have. So compañerismo is a relationship that is developed through similarities in which people come together for a particular ending, forming a community or team in the process. In this case, meaning survival, successfully navigating academic spaces, supporting one another, and completing a terminal degree, but understanding that it does not necessarily end there. Right, so there's a, there's this bond that will continue, right, moving past the graduate program, right. But the context of the graduate program brought them together, right. Very important. And, and so, what I just want to share is some kind of highlighting some quotes of kind of this idea of compañerismo and sense of belonging. So, a participant talked about how I don't know how it would be like if it was just me. And he's talking he's talking about just being in the doctoral program. Like, I feel like it would be really, really hard. But yeah, man, I'm glad that I had, that I have y'all. So you see kind of this identity that this relationship. And so this is an, a, a quote from another participant. He says, the more that, that you find that you vibe with and you connect with, the more time you're going to spend with them. The more that happens, then that means you're sharing a space together. Once you begin to share that space together, then you begin to give that space meaning. It's no longer just this place that you inhabit or frequent on a regular basis. Now it's become something else. And I think for us, the office turned into that. The bench turned into that. The Lizzie, as they called it, the library, turned into that. Wing night, so they would go out socially, right? And turned into that. It was no longer just a physical thing. It was now this physical thing that we gave meaning to. And then we started to build an attachment with. So you see this idea, once these uh, participants build this cultural bond, this relationship, this brotherhood, you would say, this compañerismo, as we call it, you know, they change, they transform spaces, right, in, into to kind of home spaces, right? And so continuing like this discussion of what this bond is, they say, well, our participants talked about our bond and the bending of space. So they talked about how like, when they were in these spaces together, they were able to bend it to them, to, to feel more, more part of the university. So our bond and bending space in this university spaces is just making it safe space for us to succeed. Like we're walking on campus with the shield, right? Another participant, again, the, these, the three males in the focus group, it wasn't a Latino space necessarily, but through our interactions, through us talking in Spanish in that space, through us playing reggaeton, right, that kind of uh, music, that's how we made that space our own. I feel like our friendship and our bond dictated what that space looked like, right? So here you see how the participants use this compañerismo, their bond, 
uh, kind of to make this sense of belonging, right? And, and then being able to, as you can imagine, combat issues of isolation, racialized microaggressions, and so, and kind of successfully navigate this space. So comp what does compañerismo and sense of belonging kind of, how does it align? Basically, we argue that compañerismo brings a connection to the school, right? Because participants started spending, once they had this bond, they were able to spend more time on campus. They were able to go more often, go to uh, like kind of those institutional spaces like the library, right? Which indirectly leads to improving academic and more opportunities to be visible, right? So professors are able to see them on campus, that visibility. So, and de you know, developing relationships with faculty. Again, also compañerismo, this brotherhood, helps affirm the doctoral's identity, right? Like they belong, right? They feel like, yes, we can be successful in these spaces. And also they encourage each other, right? To become better, to be successful. And also, again, it provides support and against encounters any challenges that both uh, various challenges that can, uh, that can occur for first generation Latino men. And so with that, you know, I want, you know, here's some uh, current publications talking more about compañerismo, if you would like to learn more about compañerismo. And also feel free, if you would like to reach out, uh, I would love to speak to you more about our, our idea of compañerismo. So Dr. Flores, um, please forgive my question, but who starts compañerismo? What is the easiest way to promote compañerismo? So as, as, so as you, you know, in the model we share, there's various reasons. For, so one is institution provides an important start, right? They need to uh, be strategic and recruit Latinos, right? So compañerismo can't be developed with one person. If there's only one Latino uh, person in your, in your institution, in your program, there's no way compañerismo can develop, right? So as you can see, it took, it took a little bit of a critical mass for it to self-develop. Right, so these individuals, it wasn't that they were like, okay, now you need, we need to be together. It was they were brought in these spaces, they recognized that their these affinity, this cultural affinity, and they came together. But it it was various uh, kind of factors at the institutional. They can create spaces, right? So they had all, some of them were assigned office spaces together. This allowed them to kind of get to begin to get to know each other, and then I think it's with time. Right, and then we argue that this can happen. Let's say you accept a Latino year one and don't accept another Latino man and um, Latino men until like the fourth year, right? So, so you know, by that time they're in different stages, right? They're not their their experiences might be different, and and so it'll be hard for them to develop this compañerismo. So, what I would say at this institutional level, you need to be strategic. But this is a, a you can't force this phenomena, right? But you can provide the opportunity to create this to, to, to occur. Question now, I'm wondering if you know of any centers on campus that kind of help facilitate compañerismo for students who might be struggling to find community. Yeah, George, so interestingly enough, the, you know, in another paper that we're working on, so we actually argue that this phenomena was not connected to actual centers, right? So this phenomena occurred naturally by being basically both, all the three participants were in the uh, School of Education, right? And so it wasn't that, but they did attend kind of like whenever a, a center was having a, a dinner, a students of color dinner, they attended it together, but it wasn't specifically created through them attending a specific center. It was occurring, it occurred naturally. This phenomena occurred naturally based on just being kind of localized and, and in the same space, right? Them being in the spa same spaces, taking the same classes, and just this idea of you're, you're another Latino man, I'm ex we're experiencing this, I'll get to know you. And then this friendship developed and then it, go, it moves beyond friendship, right? It moves beyond friendship where you start talking about what's going on with your family, you know, what's going on back home. Like, you know, oh, what are the issues that you're dealing with? I have, you know, I'm not connecting with a faculty. You know, what do I do, right? 
oh, do you want to work on this project together? So it wasn't really connect. The participants were really based on a, a actual center that created the space. It was just being in the spaces together. And that's why it becomes important that institutions need, need to be uh, aware that they need to recruit uh, a critical mass of students, right? With these shared identities. And we know that there's there's intersectional identities. So, you know, again, paying attention to that is very important. Thank you. All right, um, thank you for the invitation. So what I'm gonna focus on today is a program that we have uh, running at UAC called Las Ganas, which stands for Latinas uh, Gaining Access to Networks for Advancement in Science. And I'll talk to you about elements of our program in which we go uh, into promoting a sense of belonging um, for Latino and Latino students in, in our STEM program. For any of these programs, whether or not you're talking about a community, uh, Latino community, Black community, Native American community, um, gay, lesbian community, and so on, there need to be, I, am, I think, three key sets of resources on your campus. One is what we refer to as the Centers for Cultural Understanding and Social Change. So those are elements that involve clinic culture associated with them. Relevancy in terms of why people have a passion um, to work in these different areas. Secondly, um, we have academic support centers. If we think specifically about helping students, what are ways in which we can support those and generate those? The third is also affinity cohort programming then, and that includes kind of Lascanas and other programs in which we then create programs for certain affinity groups. Um, and so we can think about those different elements. And so I wanted to, to focus upon that. So looking upon that, we can see um, if we're looking at UIC or Centers for Cultural Understanding, we have seven of those centers, African American Cultural Center, Arab American Cultural Center, Asian American Disability Cultural Center, Gender and Sexuality Center, the um, Rafael Cintron um, Ortiz Latino Cultural Center, and the Women's Leadership and Resource Center. Each of those focus on certain areas. Um, they take pride in terms of their cultural heritage, their racial and ethnicity heritage. And this is really, really important in terms of their own passion for being with uh, those individuals together. It promotes that self-identity, but also because of we have these individual centers, they're not, as somebody mentioned earlier, not a monolith. They can actually be parts of multiple centers and therefore it helps in a way of having those types of uh, communities together that can kind of blend and develop their own intersectional sense of bonding. And so that's, I think, really important to have these um, centers available. People then can engage in certain events together in those communities and also kind of really explore kind of other um, communities as well. And so I think that's an important element. Of it. Um, next, I talked about academic support units. And so within that, um, again, depending on what your focus is in terms of academics, you may have um, various um, support centers, which um, try to focus to some of these affinity groups. So we have something like the African American Academic Center, or was noted before LADES, which is the Latin American Recruitment and Education Services. They also have specific tasks in terms of recruitment and education and leadership, developing professional skills and so on. Native American support program and, and other things like that. And also what we've also taken advantage of is working with the math and science learning centers since we're focused on STEM, we want to engage individuals that um, are skilled in terms of being able to offer tutoring in order to put groups together and be able to help those students work through um, the coursework that they're gonna have um, within their program as they matriculate. So all of these promote then retention in addition to professional leadership skills. And those are important components that we can develop in coordination with these academic support units. Then third is the affinity core programming, and that's gonna be specific depending on the affinity group. And so um, Las Ganas is part of that. The DuSable Scholars Program is for black students in STEM. Um, Sakuma scholarships focus again on kind of low income black students. Um, as students of color, Bridges to Baccalaureate is those seeking going to uh, get a baccalaureate degree. Um, that actually is a program that's a transfer student with um, transfer program with Malcolm X. We transfer students in, we work with Malcolm X. They have a specified um, track at Malcolm X in order to get their two-year associate's degree. They then transfer seamlessly to UIC. 
and they uh, move into our cancer um, biology program, work with our cancer center researchers, get into a research experience there for the junior and senior years at UIC. So it's a specific track that we kind of developed with Malcolm X. But we can do that with other community colleges in terms of being able to think about that. For just to the doc, um, doctorate, um, again, thinking about what we want to do with graduate students to get them to, to matriculate and get their degree. We have a prep program, which is that bridge year program where we recruit students that are underrepresented or marginalized students. Um, bring them in for a year, get them a research experience, work in professional skills, and then help them apply to graduate school. Um, and then Pipeline is a program we have for graduate students interested in academic careers um, to help them um, move into being postdocs. And so all of these target um, what we would be is uh, minoritized students, um, and those would be those definitely focused in terms of STEM and biomedical research. So thinking about what are the key components with all of these, what we do in Las Canas is there is an intensive undergraduate research experience. And what that does is help them actually develop new network opportunities they wouldn't normally have um, just taking courses on campus within their own field. So I think that's a, a really important element. It also helps them um, then develop their own um, set of connections with other people that have similar interests. And it gives them a reason of relevancy and pride um, and really a passion to decide that they want to move to a certain area, like cancer research or like health disparities and so on. So that's really important. If they, what we find if they really hit a tough course, and but they really find they're really interested in research, they want to continue to really work on that, get through it, and then stay in STEM. So we've seen better retention um, by really engaging them in research. It also it moves towards the development of a citizen scientist, which I think is important for the future. In all other cases, we really want to have citizens that are really engaged, kind of understand um, the world around them. And so that helps them really kind of think more analytically, think, develop their critical thinking skills. And I think that's important. It also helps them develop their intersectional identity because they're not just a Latino individual, but in fact, they're a scientist and, and develop kind of all those different kinds of characteristics as they move into develop their own career. It's a program that has holistic support and advising so that we help in terms of academic skills and professional skills. How, again, how do you fill out a resume? Um, what do you need? What are the elements you need to, to apply to graduate school or professional school? Um, how do you do an elevator talk? What are the elements in terms of reading a manuscript or writing a manuscript or giving a presentation or giving a poster and so on? So all of these things are ways in which we can help them um, in terms of certain professional skills and academic skills, very structured, it's intentional, and it's very intrusive. We also have supportive networks, and we heard before that networks are really important. Important and networks that include the faculty and staff and peers and their family. We engage their families to understand what they're doing. They want to understand why they're spending so much time on campus, why school is so important, why they're so um, engaged in terms of the research. When we have a, a research day, we invite parents to see, and they see their son or daughter um, up at a poster talking about science with other um, with other uh, students and with other scientists. And that really gives them a sense of pride as well. So really engaging the family as well, especially important if they're first generation. But it really improves their sense of belonging and it develops their social capital. Um, it also, we work on their active and collaborative learning opportunities, um, especially in typical gateway courses. So we really start to move towards having mentoring experiences with other students that are more senior students, what we call to is peer mentors. This is actually important as we see in other programs, for example, um, in the prep program for our post postback scholars, we have them um, as peer mentors, they'll have a graduate student or a postdoc in their lab that they work with. They will be somebody that they trust, somebody they, they can learn from, um, and so they become part of that, that um, research team. So these are really important elements as well. And then finally, there is some, um, substantial financial support within the program. We support them in terms of working in a lab. And what that does is they don't have to do other types of work study. They don't have to engage in a, a second job. And so it really works with the, the process that we know, which can be difficult for students and that is unmet needs. Even if they could apply for um, more loans, it really helps them in terms of what the financial um, stress is on their family and on themselves in terms of supporting their, their um, college experience. 
So if we look at the um, individual areas that we've targeted, and again, this list could be longer, but we just focus on certain areas, biological sciences, biochemistry, chemistry, neuroscience, and integrated health sciences. So these are areas that we focused on that we thought were important, um, that we that also could provide good mentoring experiences, and that we had some experience in terms of dealing with the academic aspects, the departments and so on, and engaging faculty and staff in, um, in those resources. The elements of Las Caras include basically six types of components, transition coaching, peer mentoring, research fellowship, cultural dialogues, peer tutors, and campus other campus partners. And again, this um, initiative was funded initially by the Department of Education um, HSI STEM grant. And so that was important in terms of providing seed funding. And then the, the university has continued to, to fund us and we apply for other types of grants to help kind of support elements of the program within that. So looking at tr um, transition coaching, what we've done is to go out to high schools and community colleges. We work with them in terms of meeting with students about once a week. Um, and those are interested in attending college. They have lots of questions about it. Um, and really this helps them kind of see what the options are and see what they have to do to, to move towards applying for college. So again, the trajectory might be a community college, at least initially, and then they can see whether they want to transfer from a, a two-year to a four-year um, college. Doesn't necessarily have to be UIC, or and just see what kind of transfer options they have in terms of being able to, to do what they want to do in terms of their career. They want to talk about potential careers in STEM. And so we do a lot in terms of what's out there. Um, what will they do? Do they want to go into pharmaceutical research, or do they want to be a pharmacist, or do they want to be a dentist? Do they want to be a physician? Um, and so kind of thinking about what are options out there, do they want to work for industry? Um, so we can kind of open that up because that's not always available for them, either within their own community, um, to have neighbors, to have family um, that are in these professions. And so I think that's an important element for us to be able to bring that, bring that in. We do help with the application process, including the, the paperwork you need in terms of funding. Um, we help kind of discuss kind of what's involved in terms of making certain decisions and timelines and thinking about what the orientation is, what is going to be, how is high school different than community college, how is community college different from a four-year college, what's involved kind of within that. Um, and this is really helpful too because high schools um, are stressed a lot of times in terms of providing all the resources they need. There's a lot of options that can be confusing. And they may not have the availability to a counselor that they really need to really kind of talk about what options are available. Um, really, when they get offers, understanding what's involved in terms of that award um, offer and really being able to see what the elements are and what options they have in terms of kind of, again, going and pursuing um, an education in college. Um, thinking about pre-orientation, getting that information about what's going to be available, what they should seek, and thinking about what kind of questions they can ask. Um, and then also within our program, being able to seek um, a peer mentor within our program. Again, thinking about this is important. These are generally first-generation students, and we want them to make more informed decisions about going to college. We have a program called Mentoring Con, um, con Ganas, um, and so this is to pair students, more senior students with um, junior students. And so we form these mentor-mentee dyads, one mentor and um, one or two mentees. And that's, again, starts to fall um, form a really small um, cohort, which develops again as you're kind of developing their community. Typically, these would be mentors um, that are kind of in their same field. So let's say they're a, a chemistry major. We'll try to pick them in to mentors that are also chemistry majors or biology and so on. So they have some perspective in terms of what the career track is going to be. These mentors serve as ambassadors to UIC, as guides to UIC. They help them in terms of providing another touch point in terms of seeking advice about majors and courses and so on. We have developed a number of cohorts over the years with these dyads, we pair them together. And so now we've developed alumni. Those mentors, um, those mentees then become mentors in the program. They then kind of know more and they become more engaged. And again, we found um, that our mentors, mentors actually have better retention and um, better GPAs because now they're more engaged. They're actually helping somebody else. They're developing confidence. They're developing their own sense of belonging within the community as they become more leaders within that community. 
Um, we involve some training programs, and in fact, we've institutionalized it to actually develop a course that's available that can provide training for mentors. Um, and again, even through um, episodes like the pandemic and COVID, even if the individuals couldn't meet in person, they met virtually. And they obviously use like social media and other ways to really keep in touch with each other to make sure they were doing well in courses. If there were any problems, to really help them either seek help from their mentor or to actually go to a faculty and staff and kind of be able to navigate that so they continue to do well within coursework. For a research fellow program, again, there are going to be multiple years that they're engaged in terms of developing as a core. Um, it may be a two or three year engagement. They are funded up to one or four terms um, within a scientific research lab. Um, and so that could be for us, we're in a semester system. So it could be one of the two semesters or a summer term that, um, that could be part of that. And we also meet with them weekly. And the idea um, over time to continue to bring up things that will help them in terms of developing their professional skills. Um, and then we also provide support for them to attend um, national scientific conferences or regional or local conference. Do a poster, work on kind of developing and talking science, help in terms of the networking. And so we provide things like that. Um, this week, I'm at Abercams. Abercams is a meeting here in Anaheim where we have over 2,100 students of color that are talking about science and networking together. So it's an incredible opportunity for them to see other students like themselves, whether or not they're undergraduates, graduate students, um, and thinking about perhaps academic or industrial careers. So again, it really kind of cements this sense of belonging within them. A key component of the program has been dialogue, cultural dialogues. And that is really focused on STEM in terms of really trying to combine talking about STEM and talking about their cultural heritage. So we harness their cultural heritage we get them to talk a bit about themselves. They start to learn that they have share a lot in common with others in the room. And so what challenges do they have? They realize they're not the only one that are challenged certain ways or in certain, certain ways. So they develop a really defined sense of um, identity, but they also start to develop this camaraderie in terms of being Latinx and being scientists. And so they all see themselves that way, whether or not they're going to go on an academic route or go to a professional route um, or graduate school and so on. We really think about that in terms of their um, skills again. They can share what their experiences are and has helped them in terms of their own academic, professional, and personal skills. Um, we work on critical thinking. We work on public speaking. We work on listening. We work on self-reflection. We think about understanding these differences and about how, again, those can be aligned for intersectionality. So we build a community um, of peers. We build a community that you trust, and that, again, improves their own sense of belonging on campus. It expands them as to be a capacity, um, to expands their capacity to be agents of change. And a, a number of them always say they want to go back to their communities and improve their life. So that may be tutoring for other students in high school, helping other students, um, as alumni of the program talk about college and so that they can help other students understand what the college experience is, or again, thinking in terms of health disparities and um, thinking about education and so on and how they can go back to the community and help their community. In terms of dialogue, there are always multiple sessions in very small groups, about 20 students is probably a, a reasonable size in terms of max. Um, we have multiple dialogues over a two year period um, we use a number of ways in which we engage them in terms of talking about art, talking about storytelling. We bring them, we ask them to bring in an item that's important to them or important to their family or that brings a memory or something that reminds them of their family, or their parents or some experience um, or an image, things like that. And that's ways, to, again, to connect between their cultural heritage. And then we can also talk about science. So it has to do with connections and whatever unique challenges they have. And they really see, again, how much they have in terms of common. So a lot of this goes along what's called the arc of dialogue model. Um, and that really is moving from creating that community, sharing experiences, exploring those experiences, then moving beyond and actually having um, an action, having a way that you can actually then apply that, um, that, that information. Um, if we think about um, various dialogue comment, um, diet topics that we've had, we can talk about identity, we can talk about history in terms of science, we can talk about immigration and migration and so on. We can talk about intergenerational differences. 
We can talk about environmental and, and climate justice and immigration. Again, things that a number of the students now are really passionate about. Um, if they're interested in healthcare, we talk about ethnobotany, and that has to do with thinking about health and medicine and folklore and how those are all related. So all of these are really important in terms of ways that we can connect with the students and they can see relevance in their lives. They can then see kind of community and how they're all very different, but also a kind of the commonality they have between them as well. So within all of that, we've seen um, a number of positive outcomes. So transition coaching is really important. It really helps students in high schools and community college decide on what their next steps are going to be. It really helps them foster that transition um, and exploration that they're going to be in their college experience. And they really have another touch point in terms of providing support for the mentor. The mentoring conganas um, is really a source of peer support for both mentors and mentees. Mentees gain that trusted ally, and it helps them show around campus, helps answer their questions, helps them to acclimate to the college experience, links them to resources, and they really both get enriched by that relationship. They both get something out of that that really, again, builds this really crucial supportive network. And then finally, thinking about the research experience, it provides prestige of working in a research lab, something that they, after a term or after a year, they have a real research project that they can really talk about and what they're doing and how they fit into that research team. Builds confidence to continue in science. Also, we use that as an opportunity for that research team to think about them, whether or not they're grad students, whether or not they're postdocs on that, as they're gonna develop their own research teams, they're going to go out in terms of academics or industry and think about what they're going to do in terms of mentoring, especially students that are um, going to be um, under historically underrepresented. So this is really important in terms of them as well thinking about um, being mentors on their own. So the stipend, again, is really important. It reduces the stress that they have of trying to seek additional funding and helping support their college experience. And that can be really important for these communities. I wanted to end with a couple, um, with three reflections um, on a program that kind of highlight different aspects of it. So the first one here, and I'll just read this. The stipend helps me maintain both my sister and me since my grandparents pay for everything else, some bills and rent. I feel less worried throughout this semester knowing I had some sort of income coming in while I continued my studies, working in a lab and taking care of my grandma. So again, student support um, financially was really, really important for this. The, a lot of these students really help their families, um, help pay for groceries, help pay for rent and so on. And so it can be really a stressful experience. And so we can really alleviate that. Plus they have that positive experience of really working in a lab as well. Second experience, it really helped me to stay focused on school and maintain my current GPA of 3.9. It covered the cost of my tuition, left over for me to pay out of my pocket and really helped me not stress about school being covered. It also allowed me more time to focus on working in the lab and learning new skills and networking with others. If it wasn't for Las Ganas, I wouldn't feel as successful as I currently do in my journey through IC, and I, for, I am forever grateful. And then finally, um, a last reflection thing about the program, the dialogues. The dialogues were very helpful. They were my favorite days. So much emotional and mental support. Some people are scared to talk about this or are more reserved about talking about the shock of the lab. For me, it helped remind me of where I come from and how far we have gotten. The cultural dialogues conceptualized a lot of what I didn't know how to explain. I got here with helps of others. Do I belong here? Maybe I should settle for being in the family business. I don't even think of where I would be, but the dialogues provided that support. You need to be here. They mentally and physically helped me stand my ground, that Latino in the lab. I can be here. How is it that you've been part of these panels and you were going to conferences? Dialogues are more to help me to get to that confidence level. So again, it's really been an important component to really see themselves as part of a research team, to really be part of the community that does important research. So I'll close with that, with the link um, to Las Ganas. Again, we did a lot of other things that were fun things in terms of going to baseball games and bowling and playing pool, just get together to talk with, with um, weekly check-ins and so on, just to make sure that they're navigating everything correctly, that they're staying in touch um, and that they're really enjoying the experience. So with that, I'll take any questions everybody has. I, I was wondering for the dialogues, 
I mean, you touch on many topics, different topics. So, so who moderates those 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 dialogues? I mean, because we don't know everything, right? <laughs> you you right. you talk about so many different topics. So, who who moderates that? How do you get those moderators, volunteer? You know, weekly <laughs> if you meet yeah. weekly. I was curious. Well, we, have, about. we had a couple of students um, that were part of the staff that were um, past UIC students. Um, that worked on generating that. We actually have a guidebook and uh, maybe I can share that information that actually um, frames um, a couple of the dialogues with the structure of them in, uh, how you actually get them together in terms of thinking about, um, again, uh, almost like an icebreaker, you know, what image, telling them to bring an image um, to a session and then how you kind of structure the discussion around that. So I can share that um, as mm -hmm. a guide that we've actually developed. Um, but um, we've continued to add to the repertoire of those. Initially, we only started with two. When they were so successful, we realized we wanted to have a second year and develop two more. Mm -hmm. um, now we've actually developed an honors course uh, that I'm um, teaching in ethnobotany, um, where we really talk about elements of um, obviously, uh, obviously co uh, oriental medicine, for example, folklore, traditional mm -hmm. medicine whether or not it's Native American, whether it's Latino cultures, um, whether it's Asian, um, all of those contribute to thinking about cultural heritage, um, thinking about health, thinking about medicine than traditional medicine. Um, so all of us are really important and brings again more structure to their own sense of belonging and why their culture is important um, to um, you know, modern healthcare and so on. So um, it's things that we kind of think about and develop over time. Well, um, all of these were done in um, connection with the Latino Cultural Center. So again, they also had um, some experience in terms of thinking about dialogue and developing dialogues as well. So that also kind of helped us really put this together. We pay them uh, $2,500 a semester. Um, and so that's part, that's part of it. It's up to a uh, discussion with their uh, research advisor of how much time they're gonna spend in lab. Um, and they're gonna be obviously gonna be flexible um, there may be things they really need to spend a, um, a lot of time one day with to set up some kind of experiment, um, and then they can take a few days off from that, collect the data, do the analysis, and so on. Um, there's also times where, um, what am I thinking of, whether uh, for, yeah, for experimental work, um, Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's very flexible with the research advisor. So, uh, oh, I know what I wanted to say is sometimes also students have been stressed. Let's say that midterms, final exams, things like that. Again, so long as we, uh, part of their professional skills is to um, communicate with your colleagues. Mm -hmm. And so the big part is if you're going to say, I have to take this next week off to really study for my midterms, mm -hmm. you open up to your advisor and say, I just can't be here for a week or whatever. So long as you do that, they understand, and they can, you know, you don't have to work every week a certain number of hours and so on. The time is to get the experience, make it a positive experience, um, to really see them, really answer a question, a scientific question, do those experiments, get that kind of answer and so on. That's the important positive part of the, the, the whole experience, to be part of that. Um, and so that we navigate to make sure that that's not a, a stressful experience. Mm -hmm. um, and some students have done a project and then maybe taken off a term because they know they're going to have a really hard set of courses for a term and then they come back again. So we're very flexible in terms of they can get up to four, four terms of funding, does not have to be um, four uh, cumulative four times in a row, mm -hmm. um, but we want to fit, we want to do that experience. And we've actually started in some cases earlier. So Originally, we'd only thought maybe junior and senior year. Now, sometimes we're actually engaging students in their freshman year to think about getting into a research experience. Maybe they want to do something at the at the end of their freshman year during the summer or at the end of their sophomore year, get into it. And that maybe get them engaged to think about it in their junior and senior year or more. So very flexible in terms of how we structure the program because... Um, Ultimately, the GPA, their academic work, has to be important um, right. for them to get into graduate or professional school. Right. So we want them to understand that. So, and we work with the mentors as well in terms of understanding, having that flexibility. Very good, very good. Thanks so much. It's interesting, you know, as we look, you know, uh, hearing your presentation, Dr. Spencer, like I think um, we need to really examine how we can better support our Latina Latino students. And I think mm -hmm. we're heading in the right direction, kind of like 
not only by investigating it, but also implement applying practice, which you're doing at, at your institution, which is which is great, but also seeing them as an asset, right? How can we frame making sure that we see the Latina Latino community and our diversity as as an asset, not a deficit? So right. thank you. Um, Angelica Alfaro, so um, nice to be here. And I wanted to thank um, Dr. De Mejia for the invitation, but also Dr. Vasquez, we haven't had the pleasure of meeting. Um, a lot of what you said resonated, um, and I think it's still worth repeating in some parts of my presentation, especially the piece about uh, mental health. Um, before I get started, I, I would, in full transparency, admit that I had a hard time. Um, I just wanted to make sure I was present for, for this presentation today. And the, the fact that I was having a hard time that I was being asked um, to basically be my full authentic self, I had 100% permission to show up as that today. But working for an institution that sometimes that's not always the case, because sometimes you're the only person of color in the room or you're part of a team that's not diverse. And sometimes you share your story and um, you feel vulnerable because you're the only one sharing it or you feel like you're oversharing. So sometimes you just put it on pause. So the fact that I was asked to not do that today, I had to like go through some like, I don't know what you call it, <laughs> but I, I realized that that's what it was. And for a moment that made me a little sad that we're in these spaces, but then, I had to turn that into motivation. And I think that's often what we do. And I just, and it's exhausting, um, the emotional labor that goes into our work. Um, this presentation is not exhausting. I'm not complaining. And I'm really happy to be here. Um, it really does feel like a privilege to be able to be in this space with you all. I just wanted to honor that moment um, before I got started and risk it, you know, taking a couple of minutes for my presentation. I think uh, as far as telling our story, mm -hmm. Uh, it being important to, you know, be able to do that in spaces, right? When no one else is. So um, I'm the youngest of five. I was born and raised in Chicago. I am the baby sitting on my dad's lap that you can see with the red dress. Um, and the picture uh, uh, next to that is um, my siblings a few years ago around um, the holidays. So my parents immigrated from Mexico about 45 years ago. My mom has a third grade education from Mexico and my dad about a, a sixth grade education. Um, and the fact that I'm the baby and the first and a proud graduate of the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Um, and the next and the next slide, I will uh, explain why I'm wearing this shirt. I don't know if you can see that on the screen, but now I'm a proud tia. Um, so as the baby, I didn't have younger siblings to, you know, go next. But also thinking about being in spaces with people when they talk about their grandparents graduating from UIUC. And, uh, and then I think about my abuelita and her rancho milking cows and, and you know, comparing that, those worlds um, or just hearing about these generations and generations, but seeing that it started with me, it started um, being at the university and graduating 15 years ago. So um, the picture that you see is my graduation. It's my Alaina Quinceañera. We, we have to make that a thing. This year was my 15th year since I graduated from Urbana. And my niece that's holding my cap, she's actually now a sophomore in animal sciences um, in Urbana. I just saw her this past weekend. And my nephew Leo graduated a few years ago and now he's a teacher. Um, so that's my mom and my sister and her family. Um, sometimes I, I don't know if, uh, I know for sure I'm in spaces where people don't understand what this means and what this feels like, but I am pretty safe to say that uh, people in this space understand how meaningful this is to see the next generation come through. This next quote, um, I use it often as a reminder about the work that I'm doing in the space that I'm in now, uh, working for the U of I system, for the three universities. We're serving 95,000 students, 800,000 alumni, worldwide, um, and just about 400,000 in the state of Illinois. This huge system that I'm part of, systems that I've been part of in the last 15 years of my career, and I think about being born into these broken systems 
and it truly being our job to find ways. I don't have to read the quote to you, but to really get rid to do to um, dismantle these systems. And if we're not, and if we're in these spaces, we're only making it worse, right? So that's really, and I shared this, that Latino family visit day on Sunday to give the, the parents an idea of, that's why it's in Spanish down there, hopefully translated correctly, um, to, to really it, you know, process and think about why we are in these spaces, right? Um, at the same time, trying to figure out our sense of belonging while we're doing this work on the side. Um, another piece I'll share here is, no matter if I'm in the room with 500 white people, and I have been, and I talk about the potential of our communities, the potential of black and brown people, indigenous people, and I let them in the face, and I let them sit in the fact that we have the potential, and we just need those opportunities. So that's really what the next part of my career has been, and, and tying this all back to the work that I'm doing at the university now, is that I see a system that has people who look like me and people from my communities. Um, and we want to make sure that they have opportunities because there's not anything in my entire soul or body that doubts our potential. Um, and that's, you know, it, it comes in different forms, whether it's when I worked in Chicago opening high schools a few years ago from three high schools to 18 and doing community organizing, advocacy, policy work. Um, it was with that same idea of potential and opportunity, right? And I share all of this because I am a graduate of our U of I system, right? This is what we're doing. Right now, I have a background, but I'm in my, I'm in my sala. I'm in my home that I purchased nine years ago down the street from where I grew up, where I go to buy, buy uh, my aguacates down the street. I shop locally. I shop black and brown. I shop women-owned. I'm paying taxes. The fact that my parents immigrated here and now their daughter lives down the street in the, her home that she purchased, you know, I tie it all back to the fact that higher education allowed that opportunity, um, but that doesn't give them a pass, right? Like, what else are we doing? What can we be doing more to create that sense of belonging, um, which is a lot of the work that you all are doing. Um, really quickly here, I decided to do something crazy in 2016 and run for state senate just three points shy of become of, you would have, instead of doctora, which I'm not yet, you would have said senadora Angelica Alfaro. Um, I never say I didn't, that I lost. I just say I didn't win. Um, and I gained so much from this experience. But again, tying it back to um, our opportunities that are lacking and what we need to do in community. Talk about a system, government is a system, right? Um, and then moved across the country that summer to work the presidential election. Think about uh, my heart and think about mental health at this time after not winning my election. And then 2016 happened in November. Um, I know there's some students on here and I'll just share this. Um, this is maybe not about creating a sense of belonging, but eventually because we are in these spaces and we take risks and we show up, um, we end up, uh, the, our mere presence of being in these spaces create opportunities for other people. Um, and together we start collectively creating a sense of belonging. Um, and I was able to staff Gloria Steinem and she made me sit on a panel with her um, <laughs> instead of being in the background and Angelica Maria or uh, President Joe Biden. You know, you can see the pictures here. Um, but this is all very random. This is just little Angelica from the west side of Chicago. Um, that just keeps on keeping on, which I'll talk about that in a minute. And basically everywhere that I went after the, the Department of Public Health, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, being in spaces, but always thinking about that sense of belonging, but also thinking about the opportunities for our communities. Um, and that was part of the work that we did. I was never, a, I became the DEI queen, I would call it, but it was never part of my role. I just keep, I kept seeing the, the gaps that we needed to address. And we had the first ever Pride Month ever in the history of the water reclamation and the first ever, the inaugural, you can see I'm holding that sign, Latinx Hispanic Heritage Month. It has never been done until 2019. I had someone hug me and thank me because they've been working there for 15 years. So talk about a sense of belonging, right? And, and I know that um, that work, I mean, that's, that's been my entire career up until this point. I started at the university two years ago, and I bring all of those experiences with me to this amazing system, um, but that is a system, 
And we need to continue to advocate and push, right? And really remind folks that, you know, while this was not created for us initially, we are here now and we need to continue to work together um, to make change happen. And I'm sometimes don't realize what it even means that I'm in a role at the U of I system and I meet with different people from different universities and they express gratitude because I'm there and I'm able to um, push uh, the messages and the great work that you are already doing. And in my session, I mentioned this before, I don't know how to articulate the feeling about the fact that many of the people on this call are doing amazing work that is working for our communities and our students of color. You have to constantly be advocating for more funding and constantly having to prove um, that the work that you're doing is valid. Well, it's very valid and you have someone <laughs> at the system that is reminding folks of that. But sometimes it takes, um, I'm trying to go fast, Dr. Me De Mejia. <laughs> I don't know what my timing is. Um, I just, I'm using this as one example and I, and I know it's a lot, of, a lot of words here, but I just wanted to make sure that we were able to capture. From my time at the U of I system, I realized that there was a disconnect um, with the, the people pushing certain policies um, in Springfield and even at the federal level with what was going on on the ground, right? I think, I think uh, in one of the sessions, uh, Mr. Cervantes mentioned uh, the silos that happen within our university. I'm, I learn something new every day <laughs> about each one of your universities, each department, each program. And I have to give myself grace in that moment because there's a lot happening and we're trying to be, we don't know how to talk about it. We are doing great work. Uh, once we figure out uh, what we're all doing, then we can start identifying some gaps, right? Um, but, I, but I did uh, start this initiative in our office, kind of a listening tour with all of these departments that you see here. And what my intention was, was for my team to feel, to feel your work, to feel what you are doing on the ground every day. So when we're meeting with the Latino caucus and the Black caucus, for example, we're able to talk about it in a different way. Of course, we'll bring you along for lobby day, but I thought it was really important as a reminder, right? This is not a DEI training, which that's a whole nother conversation that we need. We need that at the, at, the, at the highest level, at every level within the system, and maybe not even the one that HR offers. I did participate in the pilot. I can speak to that. Um, but this is an example of just um, having people be aware of, of what's going on and, and having us be able to speak about it in a way because lacking lived experience, we need to be able to supplement that in a way. So I end with this. Um, I, this is not easy. And I, when I started, I spoke about the, the mental, emotional labor that goes on to it, but um, I just like seeing keep on keeping on. Um, I wanted to end with some positivity and um, continuing to keep sharing your story. And by, you know, by default of that, you're creating space and keep on speaking up even if no one else is. And I know that's probably one of the hardest things. They're just like, let me turn off this Zoom camera and let me go on mute. I just, or waiting for someone to say something. I, I found myself waiting. Um, it's an hour meeting and it's 30 minutes in and I'm like, my right leg is shaking and my heart is beating really fast. And I'm like, can someone say something? Why isn't anyone saying anything? And eventually I, at like 55, you know, before the meetings of where I'm like, all right, let me speak up again. Or I found some colleagues that I would text. I'm like, okay, it's your turn. White male colleagues. Um, I'm like, I can't do this right now. So it's just really creating um, um, a village within your spaces, um, which is not easy, but, but it definitely pays off. Um, and of course, keep showing up and keep on taking care of yourself and give yourself grace as we do that. And um, I will end with this next slide. And I found, um, so how can I do this? So I know some of your cameras are off, but I'm gonna ask you all to please close your eyes <laughs> as I read this to you all. I actually just met her and I should have put the picture of us. Prisca Dorcas Mojica Rodriguez from Nicaragua. And she wrote a poem in 2015. Um, after she moved back home, got her master's and couldn't find a job. And she was at her wit's end, just feeling 
just feeling so down on herself. And she wrote a letter to little Tiska. And this is just a snippet of it. And it's, dear woke brown girl. You are eternal. You are neither here nor there, but everywhere. You carry the hood in your veins and the academia in your heart. You have not forgotten where you come from, but have learned and earned your way into spaces not meant for you. Spaces that are uninviting to your kind. You are poderosa like that. Your vocabulary is vast and your wit is sharp. You are unstoppable. So I wanted to end with that and remind us that we are unstoppable. Um, and to thank you again for um, allowing me to be here and share this space with you. Gracias. Hey, muchas gracias. Buenas tardes a todos. Buenas tardes. Uh, muchas gracias a everyone who put this event together, all your great minds, your thoughts, and your hard work for, for really bringing us all together and initiating this, this initiative. Um, I'm going to break this down in four sections. One, I'm going to share my story and my why. Two, I'm going to give you some strategies for stakeholders. Three, I'm going to give you some real specific programs. And four, I'm going to share some of these values that I carry with me every day. And I hope you do too. Let me kick it off. Uh, mi familia is de Morelia, Michoacán. Born and raised, uh, they, the three old, I am the youngest of nine children. The first three, the three eldest were born in Mexico. Uh, the other six were born here in, in Chicago. So I come from a mixed status family. Um, proud resident of La Villita. I grew up there. I still live there on purpose with the same intent of trying to be a, a, a real valuable member to my community uh, and, and not in no shame to others who, who leave the community, but I am a role model to and through in the sense of me living there and me being a resident there and me being an educator and a community organizer there. Uh, three, I did go to uh, I did go to three different high schools because I, I am a product of the zero tolerance policy where I got kicked out of two. Uh, I did transition over to the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign where I was a, a, a student of the Bridge Transition Program. Give a huge shout out to my lifetime advisor, Vito L. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here either. Um, in that career of 12 years at U of I in the middle of these cornfields, I do want to attest that I did get my uh, bachelor's in political science, Latina Latina studies, my master's in PhD, it's education policy studies, as well as Latina Latina studies. Uh, my home away from home was at the Latino studies department at La Casa Cultura Latina and the College of Education. Those three spaces were the spaces where I felt myself, where I belonged. All the other spaces in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, political science departments, I did not feel welcome in the College of Business. All of these other spaces that are predominantly white, which we already know U of I is predominantly white, but in particular, these different specific colleges within U of I are pre super pre predominantly white, where uh, people of color, specifically Latinos, are definitely excluded from feeling welcome in those spaces. My research. Because I am a product of the zero tolerance policy and my family members, as well as uh, residents, friends, colleagues, um, were part of the school to prison pipeline or the prison industrial complex, I took the, the, the challenge of doing research on my own friends, family members, and community uh, members that experienced the zero tolerance policy. When I transitioned from, from undergrad to grad, I found this policy, the zero tolerance policy, which I didn't, uh, wasn't necessarily aware of it until I found it in grad school, but I was a product of it in the sense of being, uh, going, I, I experienced the impact of this policy in high school, as well as my friend and my friends and family members. So because of that, I actually went on and researched community folks that experienced the zero tolerance from the late 18, from, from, from the late eight, eight, uh, 1980s all the way to the 2010. So we're talking about 20, 30 years of experiences from a specific community, Mexican immigrant community, uh, what we call the Mexican Mecca of the Midwest, ya yeah, Chicago, La Villita, Pilsen, that area is where I focused on. And what I did is that I captured and highlighted the stories of these individuals that got kicked out from Chicago public schools, in particular one high school. And what I did that is that I did a, a three-pronged uh, three approach in the sense of studying the community, 
did individual interviews with 20 participants from the 80s to the 2010s. So it's a mixture of young people and older folks. And then I also did a community center where I focused uh, a lot of my focus groups uh, on. The product of that, the, the, what came out of that research project was that it really instilled in me in becoming a community organizer because as I was commuting to and from Chicago and Champaign, I, I had to still or be a grad student, still get a teaching assistantship so that I can survive academically and financially at U of I while I was conducting my research. While I was conducting my research, I became a community organizer because I was involved with other community organizations that were doing the pivotal work of supporting our residents. In that work, I heard stories of if I wouldn't have ever gotten kicked out of high school, I wouldn't be working in this cheap labor job without a GED and trying to support my family of four or five or six. Other stories that came out of that was that it, it's not just this uh, binary of school to prison, it was this other layer that wasn't acknowledged, which was school to prison to deportation. Those individuals that get, in, that get uh, fed into the criminal justice system had to face this other level of barrier from language to citizenship to deportation those type of things are really just experienced, or at least for the majority, as, as, as our former um, um, panelists uh, just shared, was that, yes, Chicago is the mecca of, of, of Mexicans in the sense of there's a, a many of us. We are the, the, the largest Latino group in Chicago, more than Puerto Ricans, Colombians, or anyone else, other ethnic groups. So what we started to see is that um, the experiences of these individuals, specifically Mexican, Mexican-American, Chicano, whatever they self-identify as, had another level of barriers that really was specific to them in the sense of citizenship and language and being first generation. I am an English learner, uh, what they call an English language learner or a bilingual student. My first language was Spanish. And then we had to go through the CPS experience of losing my my Spanish language. So those type of experiences are already showcasing how we are being Americanized, how we're losing our tradition. And then while we navigate these education systems, including U of I and the UI system, they reinforce the exclusion of our historia, our cultura, our lenguaje. And, and those are the things that we need to start centering ourselves in the sense of how we can counterattack that. How can we actually make it feel where you can be bilingual, where you can speak Spanglish and be welcome in any of these spaces? We, we preach about equity and, we, and diversity and equity, but in our practices, in our theories, in our actions, in our outreach, we don't do that. We literally follow this academic approach of this top-down, let me research these community folks and don't really follow the values of being reciprocal and being in solidarity with them. So this is the reason why I, I do what I do and I, and I tapped into this career where uh, really this job was created for me. What I do for Chicago Public Schools is that I, I and I, I want to transition is that when, when I got burned out for serving 12 years, consecutive years at U of I, I, I got burned out from academia. I did not want to teach the cream of the crop. I did not want to teach those individuals that are literally at the elite magnet or elite schools that we prioritize as the most prestigious universities and colleges in the in the country. What I decided to do was actually what Sandra Cisneros says. I, I went back to those that cannot out. So I went back to my community and I served in Chicago public schools. Currently, I am the, the director of post-secondary strategic interventions. What I what all that means is that I work with, with the Department of School Counselors and post-secondary advisors in supporting high school students transitioning to whatever they wanna do after high school, in particular college. So the priority populations that I do, that I focus on is undocumented students as they transition to these higher eds, which we just said, Mexicans make up the majority of these immigrant students, undocumented students. That is the population I support as this Mexican kid from La Villita to going through U of I as, as a predominantly white institution, now going back to CPS and actually serving the communities is so fulfilling in the sense that I love what I do. In addition to that, I support 
Black males going off to college, Latino, student, Latino males going off to college, as well as these other priority populations that are students living in temporary living conditions, juvenile justice youth, uh, English uh, learners, diverse learners. I mean, there is an abundance of, of, of student groups that really need support. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there and I'm gonna transition to strategies for stakeholders. We often as academics, and I am a product of this, we often design the research project on, in our own little bucket, in our own little silo, and we hardly ever design the research project or whatever program or initiative without the people on the ground. So what I'm talking about is don't ask me what my recommendations are. Ask the current students. Ask the student clubs that are on campus. That is your first base. If we're talking about student-led work, so let's start with them. They are the ones being impacted right now. Two, alumni engagement. We have decades of alumni who are everywhere across the country, literally in Chicago, who are doing phenomenal things. Let's tap into them to figure out how they can also play a key role in, in creating the sense of belonging. Third, community engagement, whether it's in, in Champaign or Urbana, whether it's in Arcola, whether it's in Chicago or Peoria, like I'm talking about whatever you define as community, you need to engage them. How is it that we don't even have that many students who I know there's a bunch of Mexicans who live in central Illinois and we do a poor job by them. Rural students that live in Arcola who are, we are not doing a good service to them. They are Mexican, Mexican-American, whatever you define in them. We need to do a better job by that community. Fourth, faculty. They, they're always struggling because they hear the students directly. They hear the student stories directly, and yet they are still limited from whatever role they're in, they're in whether administrator or faculty. We need to tap into that other group. You are doing that. You are doing that now, which is phenomenal to see. So proud that we're, we're actually launching the Illinois Mexican and Mexican American Students Initiative. That is beautiful to see. I, I, I feel a little jealous that I wasn't there to experience it, but I'm here as an alumni to be able to serve however way I can. Let me break down some programs, transitioning to my third bucket, is what I do for, for CPS as well as supporting our priority populations is I, I run this college compact program, which is broken down into three committees. This is where we work with universities and colleges to better support the students that are going from CPS to colleges. And the way we break that down is admissions and enrollment, is one big bucket. That's just getting the students in and ensuring that they go through their processes to enroll. Two, finances. That is the committee that is in charge of financial aid, alternative, app, alternative app application, uh, scholarships, institutional aid. Those are the things that we know that if you, you can't excel if your finances ain't right. So we need to ensure that the money is correct in order for the student to be successful. Third, and this is where I told you, this is where I lived. I lived in La Casa. Those student affairs, support services, cultural centers, tutoring center, OMSA, all of those things are essential for the success of our students. Some of our students don't even tap into those things till junior year. That is late in the game. We need to do that from the on front, like from the jump, from as soon as they come in or even before. Throughout my tenure at U of I, I have always recruited students from CPS as an undergrad to come and visit U of I to expose them as early as middle school and high school. This is specifically my own agenda that I did with my own fraternity. When admissions and enrollment dropped their pre-recruitment program, we picked it up and we said, we're gonna continue to do it as our own initiative. Other thing, affinity groups, it's okay to call it what it is. You gotta create them. You have to create and support and fund these programs, whether if it's a El Caso, Puerto Rican Student Association, Mexican Student Association, uh, Mecha. I mean, literally, all of these student clubs, they need funding. They need an advisor. They need a space. They need the, the empowerment for them to carry on the work that they're doing. But we as the adults need to do a better job by them. I have been a lifetime organizer and promoter of the Black and Latino Mayo Summit. We run our own Young Men of Color Summits in Chicago Public Schools, and it is uh, uh, it's based off the model that we created at U of I 10, 15 years ago. That is still running and going, and I appreciate that we're still continuing the sustainability of those programs, but we need to be doing more and call it what it is. It's okay if it's a Black male summit. Call it what it is and support it. This is all part of targeted universalism. 
there is a theory out there. There's practices out there. This is based off of data and specific outreach, uh, the intentional strategies that we need to employ. And I'm going to leave you with these last three things. As a researcher, I learned this. And shout out to Dolores de Lago Bernal, another you know, CRT, Latchris scholar, who, who taught me some of these values. One is that everything that we do, whether it's an initiative, whether it's research, whether it's community organizing, it has to be in solidarity with the people that we're representing and that we're speaking for and with. Two, it has to be reciprocal. It cannot just be where we're taking and extracting and asking for folks to share their testimonials, their stories, their struggles, and yet we're real quick to publish and, pu and, and, and go and present at conferences and act like we're the real scholars, but there's their stories. Yet we're not doing a good service. Are you going back to the research sites where you go and stole their stories? Are you giving back to that community? Are you bringing university resources there? Are you bringing those students to colleges to expose them and get them access to these higher ed certificates, degrees, advanced degrees? Probably not. I see way more academics doing a disservice to the true value of what we call praxis Yet we're, again, we're real quick to establish our publications because we know that that's the way to get tenured. But that is not a true value to this work that we're trying to say about a sense of belonging. And this last one, and this everything that you do, come correct. Because if you don't, students, families, community organizers can see right through you, can see that you're just extracting something that you want for your own personal gain. And it's not for the real sense of being in solidarity with them. Thank you for allowing me to speak and thank you again for all the organizers that put this together. I appreciate you. Now we go to back to the meeting room and um, create this report for leadership um, system wide to create some change. We want to maximize the time and, and we're truly appreciative of y'all spending hours with us today. And we want to make sure that that we create some change um, and, and promote all the great work that we're doing. So. That's all I got. I know we're running up against time. Thank you again all so much. I hope you enjoyed our amazing guest speakers and keynotes. Um, thanks, thanks, thanks for, for coming together. And I'm really excited about both the report, also fill out the survey if you have a chance. So we can also couple that with your own um, sense of belonging experiences. And we can couple that with the report and really get, get something moving. And hang out with each other after this symposium. <laughs>